Every time central banks have gone out shooting for inflation, they've caused a recession. I think it might end up being probably a recession and probably um, maybe a couple of hundred more points downside on the S&P. What the Fed has done through tightening financial conditions has created an equity recession. Fed has done a really good job of trading markets to look for upside inflation surprises. The key question is, has the market priced in maximum Fed hawkishness? We don't think that it has. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow with equity futures up six tenths of one percent. TK, it is decision time. It is decision time, John. And I think there was a shift yesterday afternoon. Bill Dudley, who we will have on the show today, folks, with the Wall Street Journal, he came out and said, look, this is a 75-beat meeting. And, John, the market shifted. There's hey, Tom, no other way to put it. He's not alone. Barclays, Deutsche Bank, Capital Economics, Goldman, J.P. Morgan, Jeffries, Nomura, Sokgen, TD, Wells. I've got a long list of companies, banks, all looking for 75. Let's say they go with 75, Tom. What comes next? What comes next is what's going to be in the press conference. Conference and the question here is 75 and what comes next versus an adults in the room 50 50. Dominic Constum coming up in moments on this huge distinction of this meeting today. I'm looking forward to that. Bramo, before we get there, there's another central bank decision we need to look out for. And I woke up this morning not expecting this. We've got an ECB one. They're having an emergency meeting to address Italian yields. They are watching <clears throat> spreads blow out 2020 levels. They are wondering how they both control bond yields as well as tighten monetary policy, as you were pointing out earlier this morning, John. It's sort of a conundrum, and those uh, aims are at odds. What do they say in this meeting other, th other than sit around and say, what do we do? The contradictions of ECB's objectives right now. Kit Jukes of Sokgen put out the note this morning. Lisa, I think he captured it perfectly with this one question. How can you stave off fragmentation without easing monetary conditions through additional bond purchases? That's a big challenge and, for this ECB. And how do you have additional right. bond purchases without pushing down yields, without going in the opposite direction and loosening monetary conditions at the same time that you're trying to tighten them? They are in a very difficult spot. They are trying to normalize in a situation that is not normal. Last yeah. summer, the Italian 10-year term, just about 50 basis points. Yesterday, north of 4%. That's a monster change. Yeah, Italy's the focus, but I don't think it's the only focus, John. Let's run through it very quickly. Italy, and we've seen this, folks, since the beginning of the year. It's real simple. The Italy 10-year piece is from 100 on down to a 76 level. Go over to Hungary, uh, John, which is always followed, particularly in the mortgage market, the foreign. Hungary, 100 to 75 since the beginning of the year. But, John, what really gets my attention is Finland is gone down 8% from 100 to 92 in 12 days. Tom, unreal. There's so much pain in both bonds and in equities too. We need to reset. Let's get to it. Here's the price action. Equity futures bouncing back just a little bit on the S&P up a half of 1%. The pain over the previous five days though. Five days of losses. We're down John, more than 10% on the S&P 500. Into the bond market where a two-year yield over the last five days has been higher by about 70 basis points. Your 10-year coming back a little bit, Tom, down about eight or nine yeah. basis points. Just south of 340 on 10s. It's a quieter market, but Lisa, can we agree that the pain over the last five days has been John's been in Capri and we haven't. <laughs> well, John, that's may, I mean, like the reality. He may have been wherever he was. <laughs> he was definitely keeping track of this market that has been moving really quickly. That move that you were talking about, John, in the two year yield is the biggest on a basis point perspective going back to 1987. The move over in the Italian bond market, the biggest going back to 2014. This is what's getting the ECB's attention when they hold that emergency meeting today to try to address Eurozone bond turmoil. How do you address bond turmoil? Well, also tightening financial conditions. How do you damp down that volatility that you've been tamping down for more than a decade with below zero interest rates? This is the conundrum that the ECB is facing. And John, you were saying earlier today, you think the ECB may have a tougher job than the Federal Reserve. I think you're right on that. I mean, honestly, how do they deal with this at a time when people say, if you look at the credit of Italy, this is justified? Lisa, I, I think it's just so, so tough for this ECB right now. They've been talking with this word, a couple of words, actually, no limits. They're going to say they're going to come out and do this with no limits. The problem with their current plan, the reinvestment of PEP, the reinvestment of PEP has a limit, doesn't it? So we need to go beyond that. If they want to communicate to this market, there are no limits to what they will do to prevent fragmentation. I think this market wants to hear in detail what the vehicle 
the effort, the mechanism is to do that. They want details in order to have the belief that they can actually achieve it. 8.30 a.m. we get U.S. retail sales at a time when consumer confidence has plummeted to the lowest on record, at least according to the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey that came out on Friday. And the big uh, event, 2 p.m., the FOMC rate decision followed by a 2.30 uh, p.m. in New York uh, time press conference with Fed Chair Jay Powell. This after a catastrophic move in the bond market. And John, I say catastrophic because it has been nearly a 20 percent decline in mm. the overall aggregate index since uh, the highs of last year. It has just been a shocking move. When do we start to see things break down in a way that people really were worried about? At least two days ago, I said, frame that chart frame it that two-year yield chart tom is absolutely ridiculous just yeah. to see that move over the last few months yeah but again this is full faith and credit to your yield you're right john but i would go to lisa's world the corporate bond market i did a study this morning back to 2007 and corporate bonds have shifted down in price over four standard deviations that's unheard of let's get to dominic constant shall we the head of macro strategy at mizuo americas dominic straight to you and let's start with the federal reserve what are you looking for a little bit later well, we're looking for the Fed to be very hawkish, which means uh, they'll probably do the 75 uh, and then basically guarantee a very quick move to neutral. Uh, they could do more than 75. I mean, that would possibly make more sense. If they do do 50, which seems unlikely now, they'd have to go out of their way to convince the market that they were uh, uh, accelerating uh, rate hikes uh, and to get to that neutral rate. Dominic, you parse a distinction between unlikely and unnecessary. Is a 75 beat move unlikely or unnecessary? No, I think I think at this stage now, given the market reaction, particularly for the long end, uh, it's absolutely necessary uh, to, to, to move to 75. The problem they've got is that even if uh, their forecast is correct, that there's some kind of soft landing out there and that inflation can come down uh, without too much damage to growth, the market is tightening financial conditions for them uh, too aggressively, uh, both in Europe and, and, and in the US. And that's a problem. They have to stabilize the long end. Uh, so unfortunately, it's a different uh, game plan for what they had envisaged. Uh, stabilize Stabilizing the long end uh, will help them perhaps avoid a hard landing. Otherwise, uh, we've got bigger problems ahead of us. John, what's the bigger risk uh, scenario for markets right now? That the Fed is overly hawkish or overly dovish in this meeting versus market expectations? Uh, no, I would say the biggest risk is if they try and push back. I mean, uh, Powell kind of took 75 off the table last time. Uh, if they try and stick to their guns and, uh, if you like, do a do a BOJ, <laughs> trying to sort of uh, draw a line in the sand and saying we're not going to get pushed around, uh, they're going to get into a very sticky situation because they're not like the BOJ. They, they obviously don't have that kind of commitment. Uh, and on that basis, uh, I would think uh, both uh, bonds and equities would sell off hard uh, if the Fed uh, is too dovish. Uh, if they do do 50 and they don't convince us uh, that they're going to uh, have a super acceleration uh, to neutral. There's another problem that people are also uh, beginning to focus on is that their measure of neutral may just be too low. No one really knows where neutral is. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not a question of, of them going to neutral and then question mark how restrictive they might then have to become. Uh, the people will start to ask the question, uh, maybe inflation is too ticky for too long and neutral is up right. at uh, three or three and a half. Dominic, as you know, the mother of all textbooks in the United Kingdom is the Begg, John Begg, uh, in his magisterial one-volume first economics textbook. All of this is not in Begg. We're in original territory, and we're all starving for levels. What is the level of yen where this unfolds? When dollar-yen gets to such and such weakness, where do the pieces begin to fall apart? Well, I think specifically for Japan, the issue is uh, wage inflation that drives price inflation. And in a funny way, it's a similar issue across uh, uh, the, the main economies. Uh, the inflation we've got is a very bad inflation. Wages, uh, they may be going up, but they're barely keeping pace with inflation. Uh, and so therefore, uh, Japan is in the same situation. Uh, they, they're not going to react to imported inflation uh, unless wages are going up. So dollar yen uh, uh, needs to, if you like, uh, uh, can keep on going down. Uh, and it may not actually uh, uh, affect at least Kuroda's view on what should, they should do for YCC. Sure, they're going to try and push back on it. Uh, we don't think intervention is really necessarily going to work. Uh, it's more about stabilizing the global bond yields, and that will make the BOJ's uh, life a lot easier. Uh, if you can stabilize 10-year yields, there's a limit to how far uh, dollar-yen will, will uh, 10-year US yields, there's a limit to how far dollar-yen uh, will go down. 
uh, and that will, uh, uh, for them at least, maybe cap some of this imported inflation. Uh, but uh, if unless you can get to wages, I don't think uh, 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 the, the Japanese are going to really start to uh, ditch YCC uh, or, uh, or or obviously try and have any kind of normalisation on policy. Adam, I just want to finish here on the Federal Reserve, and it's a markets question. A lot of people, and you've heard this conversation too, wondering if they should just come out today and go bigger than 75, get it done, get back to neutral, go big. Would that restore confidence in this market or would it scare this market? I'm trying to understand the tipping point between hawkish enough and too hawkish. Uh, I think it will restore confidence in the back end, to be honest. I think uh, you will rally the long end uh, if you go big uh, and just get to neutral. Uh, I don't think the equity market will initially react very well. Um, but uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, there is a requirement for a massive reallocation out of equities into debt. And, the and, and that normally happens when debt yields are stabilizing, if not rallying. So we have to get to that. And it's sort of light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we see no light at the end of the tunnel until the back end of the of bond market stabilizes. When you see that light, then you can begin to see a, a way in which risk assets can also stabilize. That will come later. But right now, you're in this void. Uh, you, you, you don't know where this tunnel ends. There is no light. And that's why in going big would, wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, but you know, going 75 and committing to another 75 will, will, will sort of almost get you there, uh, I would think. Hey, Dom, thank you. Thank you very much. Dom Constant there of Mizuho Americas. TK, big question. Going into this, the decision a little bit later. It's a huge question, and we've got a wonderful lineup coming up here. We'll begin it in the 1 o'clock hour as well, and a w really great lineup this morning to frame this out. But, John, to me, it's not just 75 beeps, as you just said to Dr. Constum. The idea is the then what in the press conference. I'm sorry. He's going to be making it up, reading it off prepared words. Plus, he's got the ECB meeting to worry about. Uh, yeah. A few hours away, we might get some detail on that. Nice scheduling on that. They're facing a big risk today. In the words of Mohammed, Lisa, they risk, quote, turning the perception of the Fed from the world's most powerful central bank to an institution that too closely resembles an emerging market bank. Trying to catch up with a market that's gotten ahead of itself. This is going to be a pivotal meeting. Some really strong words from Mohammed al Arian out on Bloomberg Opinion this morning. Good morning to you all. Futures up a half of 1%. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. U.S. Democrats appear to be considering new energy legislation. Sources say Oregon Senator Ron Wyden may propose a surtax of up to 42 percent on companies that record a profit margin better than 10 percent. Democrats and the White House are struggling to curb U.S. energy costs and broader inflation. European Central Bank's governing council is ready to step in if it considers moves in government bond markets to be unjustified, according to Belgium's Pierre Wunsch, who said the group is open to taking action if markets are overreacting. The ECB is holding an emergency meeting to discuss a recent sell-off in government bonds. The UK has cancelled its first flight, deporting asylum seekers to Rwanda. The European Court of Human Rights blocked the deportation, saying there's a risk of irreversible harm. For the asylum seekers, the government says it is trying to discourage the work of human smugglers, but the policy has been condemned by UK rights groups and some lawmakers. China's economy had a mixed recovery in May as COVID-19 restrictions eased with industrial production increasing whilst consumer spending and the property market contracted. Industrial output rose 0.7% from a year ago, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, while the almost 7% contraction in retail sales was better than the prior month's plunge. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City, for our audience worldwide, TK jamming out to the music on this Fed decision day and an ECB decision as well. Tom, is that your dance move? That's is that you're going to dance, That's move. dance move? That's nice. I'm learning a lot about Europe this morning. How's that working out? It's where I had no idea how small Hungary's economy. The director missed the dance move. 
John. Do you want to do that again? Yeah. Uh, John, it's like, you know. Nice. It's like, you okay. know, and folks, coming next yeah, month, bobbleheads. We're going to have surveillance bobbleheads. <laughs> We're starting with Lisa. John, I had no idea Hungary is literally like one-tenth the size of Italy's economy. Yeah. I think we're, I'm learning stuff oh, every on day. On this ECB Fed decision day, that's your focus. Thank yeah. you. Futures it, positive, a half of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up about seven-tenths of 1%. This is a real turnaround, TK, from the last couple of days, the last five days, for that matter. Well, can you imagine Chairman Powell in his slippers last night getting, you know, busy day at the Fed in a meeting and getting ready, and all of a sudden, boom, there's a, there's a courier drops an email the ECB is going to get out front of you with an emergency meeting. I mean, it changes the tone, doesn't it? Well, get out front, Tom. The FX channel, I think, for me, is absolutely fascinating. Someone's going to be unhappy here, aren't they? Right. Cable in and around 120, a break of it this week. Euro yeah. dollar threatening it, 103 again afternoon. this yeah. week. Yeah. And someone's going to be uncomfortable <clears throat> with what the currency is doing. And we've said repeatedly, this is the previous decade in reverse. Do you remember that? Rates rock bottom, get inflation higher, try and get a weaker currency. Yeah. Opposite yeah. story this time around. It is. Let's get some perspective. Or Amory Horton in Washington uh, on the economy and certainly watching the inflation watch with the White House. But right now in Brussels, leading our economic coverage in Europe, Maria Tadeo uh, joins us this morning. Maria, I'm suggesting this is not just about Italy. For global Wall Street, that's going to be the move. But I've walked through Finland's change in price of debt. Hungary's a, f a train wreck. There's no other way uh, to put it. It's not just about Italy, is it? With Hungary moving out 277 beeps, out well over 600 beeps. Uh, well, Tom, look, I think you, you see a recalibration in many ways as a result of the change in policy uh, from the European Central Bank. And it's not just an Italian story. In some ways, the moves reflect that. But, Tom, I think the importance of Italy is something that cannot be understated. There's a reason why we talk so much about this country. This is the third biggest economy in the euro area. This is a founding member of the euro. And, of course, it does carry a lot of weight in all of this. For many in the European Central Bank, and they've been <laughs> right. in a room now for about an hour 30 minutes this is a country that you have to treat differently did germany force this meeting i don't think it was the germans and i think the issues that we see today come from the fact that last week the governing council could not agree on what danger would be for the btp and they did not anticipate the moves if you remember that press conference by christine lagarde she was asked four times i was there at that press conference how are you going to fight fragmentation and she could not really give any details that means there was no consensus behind the scenes and now we've seen of course the market test the ecb and pile on the italians there has been a lot of jitters for the past two days. So I don't think this is coming from the Hawks. It's very clear that they own and control the ECB now. This is about the periphery, how to avoid that fragmentation. And by the way, Tom, if today the European Central Bank does not tackle fragmentation and they only talk about reinvesting the PEP program, we're in for another big disappointment. This is a replay of last Thursday. And Maria, what's the mood right now in the White House and the other side of the pond where we have two bad decisions for the Federal Reserve? Inflation that by many accounts is way too too high for this president to get reelected, at least at this point. The consumer, the sentiment has absolutely plummeted. What is the mood on Washington, uh, D.C.? I think you can really sum it up with just frustration, right? That's the mood of the electorate when you, electorate, when you look at the, the level of inflation and rising consumer prices, but also in the White House, what is sticking in terms of to get inflation down? Lisa, you said it yesterday. They're throwing spaghetti at the wall in terms of trying to talk about why inflation is happening and what they can do to bring it down, and nothing is really sticking. The president has called this the bane of our existence. That's what he said to Jimmy Kimmel. I believe he repeated it yesterday as well when he was speaking to the AFL-CIO. So these inflation numbers are really hurting the White House. They're hurting also the Democratic Party when you look at what they could pick up in terms of seats or hold on to seats in November. And you're seeing that frustration play out. What are they looking to do? A potentially tax higher surtax on oil companies. Is that going to change the price of gasoline tomorrow? No. Would it potentially become law by the time people go out to vote in November? Probably not. Well, yet this is maybe a new tool they can use to message they are trying to do everything they can 
to go after oil companies, which they say are unfairly targeting consumers. So what are the details of this proposal that basically any profits over 10 percent they would tax? Is this basically a non-existent proposal that is just a messaging tool or is it something substantial akin to the windfall tax over in Britain? Well, listen, it depends if they can get 50 senators. They're all Democratic senators to sign on to this. And uh, we haven't seen the text legislation yet, but Ron Wyden, the senator from Oregon, who's uh, really leading the charge on this, says it would be for those companies that are making this excessive profit. But those that are potentially going to ease the pressure on consumers won't face it. So maybe this is a little bit of a carrot and a stick. At the same time, we have this morning the president writing letters to the likes of Evron, Valerio, Chevron talking about refining capacity. The president saying that he wants to change this. He wants immediate action on refining capacity and thinks what is happening right now with this refining capacity issue, what oil companies are doing, what he says they are the ones to blame. He said it last week. Exxon is making more money than God, that they need to take immediate effect and action Marie, to change this. Let's talk about that. We've got a minute. That is ridiculous. The oil companies have got enough money to lobby for themselves. I'm not going to do that for them. But you've had someone go on a campaign <laughs> trail. Do. You've had Democrats for years and years and years push ESG. They didn't want any new refiners built for years. And now they want the oil companies to go out and build refiners. Are you, are you kidding? Who's going to do that? Who in their right mind running a company would do that, knowing what the push is over the next 10 years and beyond? Yeah, and some of these refineries are actually moving to a little bit more sustainable fuel because that is just the momentum, right, of not just politics, but also ESG and investment in the banking community. It's a difficult time for the administration, right, because they came into this year talking about renewables and now they need to reverse. Anne-Marie, thank you. AMH down in D.C. Maria Tadeo, thank you as well. TK. Talk about contradicting yourself on a big, big issue. Uh, again, I'm going to look at the deciles of the American public, and it's real simple. The middle class is going to get crushed. Chairman Powell will address that today, I'm more than certain. A future's up four tenths of one percent. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Taking me 30 minutes to realize why Tom keeps bringing up Hungary. Were you watching the football yesterday? You got that right. Okay. Oh, That's what that. Do, do you want to be friends with the city of London this morning? Tom? No, you know, I'm not just, interested in that. I just, you know, I mean, I just I had a beverage in my hand and, you know, Mr. Southgate, what do you think, John? Clearly, Is it history? Clearly, it's taken me a little while, Tom, to get up to speed with your sense well, of humor. Well, you're still thinking you got an Aperol spritz in your, your hand and thinking about Capri. Just a Aperol spritz. Yeah. Futures, positive four-tenths of one percent this morning. Good morning. Good morning, Gareth Southgate as well. England having a very, very tough evening against Hungary just yesterday. Futures positive on the Nasdaq 100 as well, up six-tenths of one percent, up about 68 points. Over the previous five days, what a move we've seen. Down by more than 10 percent over five days on the S&P 500. And that's matched, backed up, in fact, somehow instigated by what's happened in the bond market. Two-year yields over that same period, up 70 basis points. Let's talk about the bond market, twos, tens and thirties. Yields come in, 12 basis points ahead of the Fed, ahead of the ECB two, your two-year, 330, your 10-year, 338, getting close to 350 in the last 24 hours. But let's talk about Europe ahead of this meeting with the ECB, which is happening right now. Expecting a conclusion to that in about 29 minutes' time. Yields in Italy were about 50 basis points 12 months ago. 50 basis points. They were looking at 4% in the last 24 hours. Your 10-year right now comes back in 28 basis points off the back of this idea that the ECB needs to do something about fragmentation. How do you reconcile this? The contradictions of the ECB effort right now, their goals, to tighten financial conditions and stop bond yields rising in certain places. The president of the ECB last week talked about fragmentation impairing monetary policy. And I'll give you an example of that, the euro. What happens if Italian yields break out and the euro breaks down. I would argue that's a big, big problem if you want to tighten financial conditions and do something, Tom, about a euro that's too weak as opposed to too strong yeah. and help bring inflation down, which brings up a more important point with the FX channel. This is something central bankers don't want to talk about. They don't want to talk about, but we can talk about it. The FX channel is going to be an important channel I to agree. do something yes, about yes. important inflation. 
But when it comes to FX, not everyone can win that game, Tom. What we've got to talk about is who is the loser going to be. The Bank of England with cable in at around 120, the ECB with euro dollar in at around 104, or a Federal Reserve, which so far is winning with a very, very strong dollar. Well, you triangulate that off the Bloomberg, and there's also secondary triangulations as well. We're not going to go into it right now, but, John, what I would emphasize, and I say this in honor of the great Liz Goldenberg, who invented bond coverage at Bloomberg, and Liz and I would lecture on price, John. There's a point where yield doesn't matter. This is about price, and the sweat of that ECB meeting is price declines. Well, Tom, I don't think that the ECB is going to be too concerned about investors losing money. What they will be concerned about is the interest payment that the Italian government will have to pay when they come back to market. The Spanish government, yeah. the Greek government, they're going to be the issues in play for them. <clears throat> right now with us, and we've got a really nice mix of guests today, uh, and then also in our special coverage this afternoon, Dean Kernett joins, founder, chief executive officer, Macro Risk Advisors, on the mathiness of VIX in the derivative market. Dean Kernett, I'm not going to call it a path to 40, but maybe in the angst, a trek to 40. How do you presume we migrate from a 32 VIX out to the fear and the angst, the catharsis of a VIX of 40? Well, Tom, I like to say that uh, nothing good happens in equity markets when the VIX is around 30, but bad things start to happen when it's at 40. And so we should be asking ourselves this exact question. How, how is it that we get to 40? And there's a couple of things we can do. We can look to history. We can look to LDCM in 1998. We can look to the back end of the, the telco bust with the Delphia and WorldCom in 2002. Those were both low 40 VIX events. And two things uh, were different then from now. Um, one is realized volatility got into the 40s. So sure, these markets are punishing. We're getting 2% moves, sometimes even 3 and 4% moves. To get to 40 plus realized volatility, you got to be having a 3%-ish move a day. So we have to sprinkle in a 5% move here and there. So we're, we're, we're almost there. Uh, you, know, you, you can see the pathway because markets that fall this quickly they tend to destabilize themselves. Things pop up, tail risks pop up. So that's the first one is, is realized volatility. It's the, it's the daily size of the moves in the S&P. The second one is, and this is where I would differentiate now versus 1998, 2002, is that there is not really the pricing of the deep, far out of the money left tail in the market. The, the outcome that would truly spill over into the markets and create a, a kind of a toppling effect. In 98, it was the LTCM, port LTCM portfolio that really was the risk in the market. In 2002, the risk of bankruptcy for many companies was very high. Credit yeah. spreads were mm -hmm. far wider than they are now. So my concern is as, we, uh, as, as prices deteriorate, these macro uh, kind of uh, spillover events, John is just talking about things in Italy, these become issues. And so with further price deterioration, we could easily get to a VIX of 40. Dean, can you talk to me about that? Who's going to lose this game of central banking right now? It seems to me that the FX channel is in play. Can you give me your perspective on it? Well, I think the equity market's going to lose the game, I think. Um, you know, and, and I think it's, it's quite interesting. There used to be a, a term during the disinflation period. It was called the ugly contest in FX. How, how weak could you make your currency versus other currencies to effectively try to bring in inflation, you know, lower the price of your currency so you could kind of juice up risk assets and, and import inflation. Now we're obviously trying to do uh, the exact other, um, you know, every, the, the exact other thing is, is on the minds of central bankers. I think for, for equity markets, I like to say that equities are short the straddle on interest rates. Uh, so higher rates or lower rates are going to be very challenging for equity markets. And the move index just got to 135 plus, it, it's a very dicey time uh, for equity markets. And, and what I would say is um, because volatility has risen so much and not just volatility, but correlation between stock and bond prices is just in a different regime. It, it switched regimes last year. It's totally different. And so without doing a thing, without lifting a finger, your portfolio just got a lot bigger on a realized volatility basis. And so that means you've got to de-risk your portfolio. You just have to run a lot tighter and leaner than you did even a year ago. Dean, in your study of financial stability, you've said that markets do crazy things when they are stressed. Markets are definitely stressed. When do we see things break down, forced selling, not only with stocks, which we've seen to some extent on the peripheries, but also with bonds? 
Right. So I think we actually had some semblance of getting there a couple of weeks ago. What you had seen is a, a big rise in the implied number of tightenings, let's say out to December. You can find that on your WIRP page. And you, you saw that uh, the implied tightenings got to, uh, to 10, they went down to eight, and then they just kind of hung out between seven and a half and eight tightenings of, of 25 basis points. And that was the market saying, yeah, I think we can get to about two and a half percent of the funds rate, and then we'll, we'll sort of pause. And of course, CPI just undid all of that. And so, Lisa, what I would say is we need to see a lowering of interest rate volatility. That's going to be some signal that the market and the Fed are kind of speaking the same language and that the Fed has got some confidence that what it's done is enough. And, and I think what's just so tricky is the reality is the Fed may already have done not just enough, but too much. Uh, we, our economy operates through markets. We operate through the wealth, wealth effect. We operate through financial conditions. And boy, they have tightened in a hurry, right? It's not just stocks, it's vol, it's credit spreads. It's obviously base interest rates. So we may have already done enough and we just don't realize it yet. This is what makes central banking so difficult at this point. What a task they've got in front of them. Dean, thank you. Dean Kernan, a macro risk advisors. And to Dean's point, We've got inflation worry after inflation worry over the last week, Lisa. That's what the Fed's confronting today. You speak to economists right now who are on board with this idea the Fed's going to hike 75, maybe signal another 75. They can keep doing that until they're confronted by weaker data. When they get confronted by that weaker data, we need a deeper understanding of how they're going to respond to that if inflation is still persisting. <laughs> because that is the big, big conundrum dilemma that they face potentially later this year. All central banks were hoping to be helped into a soft landing by softer inflation data. They were hoping that the data would cooperate, that we would get some sort of disinflationary force from those exogenous shocks easing up a bit. They have not gotten that. And so now they're faced with what do we do in the face of stagflation? That's what you're describing right now, John. And we're looking at uh, what they're going to do ahead of that. How do they get ahead of that at a time when the market's already there and they're not clear what the market will do when they signal that they're there right there with them? Something stuck with me from the last couple of weeks, Tom. It was payrolls Friday and we caught up with Rick Reader of BlackRock. And Rick turned around straight out the gate and just said, I think, and I'm paraphrasing here, I think that that's the last good one. That's the last solid one. And that in a not too distant future, in our not too distant future, we will have a negative <laughs> payrolls print. For the <clears> Fed today, they don't have that information yet. They might be able to say we think that's in the future, but ultimately, Tom, they've got to respond to the inflation data today. And I don't think that's just about economics. I think it's about politics, too, <clears throat> and that's something they won't speak to at and this the, meeting. The president's going to fold it into the housing market. You know, we've got Michelle Meyer coming up, which is important. But, John, I'm sorry. This is going to fold into mortgages up near 6 percent. Julia Coronado mentioning the 6 percent uh, level is, is key. I want to give you some price pain, John. I mentioned Liz Goldenberg earlier. You know, I, you know, I do a, a mid-month mid check on my portfolio. How's that And going? that Austria 100 is just <laughs> working out. I loaded the boat on that puppy. Uh, Thank you, Dr. O'Leary. And I'm down 70% on that on price. Brutal. Brutal you losses, know, TK. I, I You've made can't... that point repeatedly in the bond market. There are some <clears throat> brutal losses taking place. I, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a bond bear market uh, we've never seen. John, other research we're doing here this morning, particularly with the ECB coming out, maybe we'll see something in 20 uh, minutes here. We look at the ratio of population of England to Hungary. And we just, you know, we're trying to get scope and scale for Hungary for this emergency ECB meeting. And it's 5.74 to 1. I wanted to go out to two digits uh, there, John, because there was four goals. I go to two digits. What currency does Hungary use, TK? Foreign. <clears throat> That's right. What's the ECB got to do with it today? What's going to... Uh, I... You know, are, are the Germans driving the bus here? That's what I want to know. Each is up for half of 1% from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. European energy consumers are bracing for even higher prices due to possible disruptions to supply from Russia and the US. Western sanctions have left a turbine for the Nord Stream pipeline stuck in Canada and Gazprom has reduced flows to Germany through Nord Stream by 40 percent. A longer than expected outage at a US LNG terminal also added to price pressures. Heavy rain and rapid snow melt at Yellowstone National Park triggered flooding that tore out bridges and damaged nearby homes. The raging waters may force roadways that were partially 
torn away to be rebuilt elsewhere. The unprecedented flooding drove more than 10,000 visitors out of the nation's oldest national park, which could stay closed for a week. Nobody reported was hurt. A big tweet by founder of Three Arrows Capital, an influential hedge fund that has been liquidating crypto holdings as prices plummeted, is creating new apprehension in the industry. Former Credit Suisse group trader Su Zhu tweeted his group was, quote, fully committed to working this out. Without providing further details, there's been no further comment from Zhu. Bill Gates has dismissed cryptocurrency and NFTs as shams based on what he calls the greater fool theory. Speaking at a climate conference, Gates said digital banking efforts supported by his philanthropic foundations are hundreds of times more efficient than crypto. Gates sparred with Elon Musk last year over whether Bitcoin was too risky for retail investors and the environmental harm of mining coins. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. FOMC meetings and three options for rate hikes, 50, 75, or 100. And what that's going to depend on is whether we see signs of moderating inflation or demand destruction. Unfortunately, there's no signs of inflation alleviating. But the key question is, has the market priced in maximum Fed hawkishness? We don't think that it has. I've got no idea at this point what max hawkishness actually is based on the developments of the last couple of yep. months. Sarah Malik there of Nuveen. Think about where we have been. We've gone from Bank of America saying we'll get a hike every meeting this year and people laughing. Then that became consensus. Then we had Andrew Hollenhorst's city come out and say 50, 50, 50, 50 for four straight meetings. People laughed. It became consensus. And then we had a 75 basis point idea, I think, floated by President <coughs> Bullard. Lisa, a number of weeks ago, I laughed. It's consensus for today. <laughs> the I market mean, this is, is how things, things have moved so quickly. It has moved the fastest if you take a look at short-term yields going back to 1987 to give you some size and scope. At what point do we have to look at a Fed whose hand is being forced and is going to go much more, uh, perhaps, than they had intended to or that they have foreseen in their forecasts? The TK futures positive a half of 1% previous five days, down more than 10%. Yeah. Brutal. Yeah, but it's brutal, and we're looking at the price, even with the market where it is, folks. We're looking at the price dynamics uh, there. John, we got to do a surveillance correction right now. Dr. Larry, good morning in Cambridge, listening and watching this morning, and, and he insists we go out to four digits on the England to Hungary population ratio. He wants to stay on top of that he story. He wants to stay he? on top of that with four goals scored. He really feels we need to go to four uh, decimal points on that, so it's 5.74. Thank you, Tom. Uh, something. So I just wanted to bring that I, of course, up. have more well, affection for the Italian national team but they didn't do so right. well yesterday evening either yeah. so we can avoid that too yeah let's well, like to talk about the ecb i'm told they make a decision in about 11 minutes time 11 minutes time we'll have a brief on there right now we're going to brief on this fed meeting today michelle meyer joins us u.s chief economist mastercard economics uh, institute i guess it's about the consumer after the housing transaction michelle you are truly expert at housing what are the dynamics you see with a new six percent mortgage rate in housing and rental and then how it folds over into what mastercard sees sure absolutely good morning tom um, so we are seeing a real moderation in, in the housing market. Home sales are now falling for several months in a row. If you look at the more granular data, for example, from Redfin or from Zillow, you are seeing that homes are sitting on the market a little bit longer. The percent of homes that are selling above ask has gone down. So the market has started to turn, and that makes a complete amount of sense because mortgage rates have jumped higher in an environment where affordability was already stretched because of extremely big price gains. Um, on top of that, there was this kind of change in timing around when people were buying because so many people concentrated these home purchases right after the pandemic when they were quarantining, when they moved into this kind of major goods consumption. And that has therefore pulled forward some of the demand. So for the Fed's point of view, they are saying, yeah, what's the parts of the economy where there's been excesses? Housing is one of them. How do they try to tamper down those excesses? increasing interest rates in that interest-sensitive sector, and you see the impact. So to me, the Fed is looking at what's happening in the housing market and saying, monetary policy is transmitting. That's a good thing. 
Michelle, I'm trying to work out when it starts to become a bad thing. When do we start right. to see that really weak economic data that people are starting to forecast? And where is the Fed once we get to that point? So I think for the broad economy, we have a while to go before you see the real turnaround. And there's a number of reasons why. The first, the consumer is the heart of the economy and the consumer is still strong. The consumer is still outspending. The consumer still is sitting on, on excess savings. The household balance sheets are strong. We just got the latest data from the Federal Reserve flow of funds and yes, Household assets dipped a bit in the first quarter, but very modestly. Um, and meanwhile, deposits actually picked up. So there's still purchasing power out there. Um, the labor market, look at the last jobs report. It was still strong. The experience economy is still actively adding workers. So it's going to take a much more time and I think effort from the Fed to really effectively moderate growth and cool inflation here. Michelle, a, a listener uh, writes in that organic deflation is already happening around the country. If you strip out food, if you strip out energy costs, you are seeing prices moderate or even tick down a bit in areas. How much do you you think that this is actually what we should be watching and might raise some red flags for moving much more aggressively for the Fed? So look, there are lots of different kind of categories of the consumer basket and of inflation. And I think the easiest way to separate it is those goods categories and non-durable versus durable. And then the leisure categories or the services categories. In the last CPI report, there were glimmers of price um, slowing or inflation slowing in certain goods. Um, and that's particularly in categories where there was this big concentration of demand, some unwanted inventory, and some very modest discounting. But that is not the majority by any means. If you look at the services side of the economy, there's an acceleration of inflation, particularly for things like travel, right. even for shelter. So I would argue there's still broad-based inflation here. I mean, but the, the answer is the Boston University textbooks, Michelle, say demand destruction clicks in. Where's the demand destruction? So it's starting to click in, Tom, as you mentioned at the beginning, in housing. Um, you're going to start to see that spill over into the economy. You're going to start to see other areas of the economy that are more interest sensitive see that weakening. But it's not going to be overnight. And I think that's because of the extraordinary amount of stimulus that was pumped in over the last two years. The Fed, as you all were talking about before, was intentionally behind the curve. They were intentionally trying to overstimulate the economy. And that was coupled with well, a, a large amount you know, of fiscal stimulus. Okay, but is this September 27th? I mean, give us a date here. Do we go to Jackson? <laughs> do we go to Jackson Hole amid nine percent inflation? I think we're going to go through the summer with still heightened inflation as people are still outspending, and you still have some of these 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 challenges in terms of meeting that meeting that capacity. Yeah. I think as we get into the fall and to the end of the year after the holiday shopping season then you can really start to see things turn in the economy more broadly. In Michelle, I've got to squeeze this in. Does the consumer lever yeah. up first before that happens? And are you seeing signs of that? You've got the perfect window into it. Yeah. Are you seeing signs of it at the moment? I mean, look at what the Fed is reporting from, again, their last flow of funds report or the New York Fed's um, quarterly survey. Yeah, I mean, consumer credit is increasing from very low levels. The, the consumer spent the last year deleveraging, reducing their, their debt for revolving credit. So yes, you are seeing that pick up and that should expect to continue. Michelle, thank you. From MasterCard you Economics can. Institute. Thank you, brilliant as always. Lisa, that's the fear here, isn't it? The consumer turns to credit cards. We've talked about it. Some people come on the show and say it's a sign of strength, consumer balance sheets, all of that stuff. Not many people buying that strong consumer narrative based on what's happening with credit trends at the moment. They want to keep buying goods at the same pace. The prices have gone up, so they borrow money to do so. At what point does the bill come due and how much does this exacerbate the downside of this economic cycle? Well, the ECB has got a big call to make and they're set to make it in about five minutes time. A meeting happening this morning. How do you raise interest rates through the summer and keep a lid? on Italian yields. The ECB will try and provide an answer to that question, potentially, in about five minutes. Equity futures up a half of 1% on the S&P. Yields come in 10 or 11 basis points on a US 10-year to 337. And on a whole lot more on an Italian 10-year, down 32 basis points to 384. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
time central banks have gone out shooting for inflation, they've caused a recession. I think it might end up being probably a recession and probably um, maybe a couple of hundred more points downside on the S&P. What the Fed has done through tightening financial conditions has created an equity recession. The Fed has done a really good job of trading markets to look for upside inflation surprises. Key question is, has the market priced in maximum Fed hawkishness? We don't think that it has. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It is Central Bank Decision Day from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures up four tenths of one percent. The Federal Reserve a little bit later this afternoon. TK, before that, we're waiting for something from the ECB. Yeah, for those just joining in here in the Follies, and we'll be with you this afternoon, scheduled the Fed meeting. But this ECB meeting right now, John, can you imagine Chairman Powell yesterday afternoon, uh, Lagarde dials 1-800-ECHOES building and goes, oh, we're going to front run you. Yeah, and we've got a call to make. And Tom, they've got a tough, tough one. How do you thread this needle? How do you raise well, interest oh, rates on. and stop the Italian bond market from breaking down? I don't want to interrupt here as we're waiting on ECB headlines. We'll see what we see. But, John, I'm sorry. This goes back to Jean Monnet. The system didn't work then. It didn't work along the way. And it doesn't work now. Where's the fiscal policy to be a combined cushion for the price changes we're observing? A fragmentation, Lisa. That is a fancy way of saying you are worried about what happens with the Italian bond market. And you said it well when it's about when they have to refinance, when they actually have to borrow money to finance an economy that inevitably is going to slow because of the tightening that you're going to see from the ECB. Between a rock and a hard place becomes even more difficult to parse through for the ECB. And they're dealing with a Fed that is calling their hand, especially given the euro and the weakening there ahead of a more hawkish Fed. What does that do in terms of imported inflation? It's funny, Tom, that you mentioned the ECB getting out, getting out in front of the Federal Reserve. Did Chairman Powell get out in front of the Federal Reserve meeting with that series of media stories this week, Tom, teeing up 75 basis points. Yeah, you know, I'm there, but I'm going to go to one moment yesterday afternoon in the zeitgeist where I think it was the Wall Street Journal, my brain freezes over, where Bill Dudley, who will be with us this afternoon, just said, look, they're going to go 75 beeps. And that, to me, as a former Fed president, was the shift. Uh, in the mood yesterday. A long list of banks looking for 75 basis yeah. points a little bit later this afternoon. Futures look like this on the S&P. A bounce back on the S&P by about a half of 1%, call it four tenths of 1% higher. The Nasdaq 100 up by six tenths of 1%. The last five days, down more than 10% on the S&P 500. The last five days in a bond market, yields higher, much higher on a two-year by 70 basis points. We take some of that back this morning across the curve. On tens, we're down about nine or 10 basis points, Lisa, to three 37.92. Although very fluid, and it was very fluid yesterday, especially heading into the close. Very fluid as we await those headlines from the ECB's meeting. It was an emergency meeting having to do with Italian bond yields, Spanish bond yields, Greek bond yields. How do we get those into a controlled manner at a time when we are tightening? That is the dilemma for the ECB, and Italian 10-year yields did hit uh, more than 4%, the highest going back to 2014. As John said, we want details, and so perhaps we will get some. 8.30 a.m., U.S. retail sales come out. Going back to what Michelle was saying, Michelle Meyer, about how there still is a lot of demand. And frankly, you do see people borrowing to support that demand. She also talked about not only is there a levering up, but that inflation, yes, maybe outside of food and energy, it is not as quick. But definitely, it is still broad-based and not coming down that quickly. And at 2 p.m., the FOMC rate decision uh, we get, perhaps it'll be 75 basis points, which would be the biggest move going back to 1994 followed by that 2.30 uh, p.m. press conference with Fed Chair Jay Powell. Very much the focus, John. How much will he signal a terminal rate akin to what the market is looking for right now, which could be as high as 4% next year? Elisa, we're on the same page. Tom, a lot of banks have made a move to talk about 75 basis points <clears throat> later this afternoon. I've read through so much research in the last couple of days. They've moved the timeline, but not the destination. Yeah. How far is this Fed going to take things? Does that change at today's meeting? The timeline's really, really important. I like. I think this is a Bank of England official uh, last night. Uh, Kane, the economist, Kane, saying we've got to keep our heads up. And you know, to me, that was a very important First statement. Name Harry, John, so. from Bank of England coming up later. First name Harry. Yeah, yeah Second I think, name Kane. Yeah, it's time yeah. to keep our heads up. He uh, said. I'm not sure that's the Bank of England. Okay. You can take Bank of and put football team at the end and. 
probably get closer to what you're talking about. Probably closer, 1928. Uh, are we done talking about We're that? We're done talking about because it. Because I, I like my friends in the City of London. I'd like them to stay Good morning to the, the City of London. Good Sterling to Stronger. You. Tough evening for the England national football team mm -hmm. yesterday evening. On the ECB, just a couple of things. So we heard this morning they will have an unscheduled monetary policy meeting, an emergency one, in the words of so many of us. It was going to last about two hours. That two hours is up. Of course, this is not scheduled. It can go longer. We have no idea when we get a statement, no idea if we even get a statement after that concludes, though that is likely. We're waiting for that. When we get it, we'll bring it to you. For the Federal Reserve a little bit later this afternoon, I hear all this talk about recession risk. I haven't seen many people downgrade their earnings estimates. Here's one right now. Binky Chatter, the Chief Global Strategist and Head of Asset Allocation at Deutsche Bank. Binky, great to catch up. The team at Deutsche Bank, first out the gate to say recession at the end of next year. Talk to me about why you're downgrading your earnings story and why you haven't cut your outlook for the S&P just yet in a big way. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, what I would say first is that you know, I think it's important to keep in mind the house call remains for a recession, you know, at the end of next year, but not near term. Uh, you know, I think the word that everybody is uh, talking about is fluid. So things remain pretty fluid. Uh, and, and most of our downgrade to earnings is about next year, building in that uh, slowing in growth and recession later next year. I think the bigger issue for the equity market on earnings, of course, is, uh, you know, what the bottom up consensus is doing and what basically it is building in. And what I would argue is that basically, you know, the bottom up consensus has 10 percent earnings growth for this year, 10 percent earnings growth for <coughs> next year. On the face of it, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. 10% right. earnings growth is actually the average earnings okay, growth outside of recessions. Within the sum of this, and Fulkert's Landau and your team, Lizetti with us this afternoon, folks, has just been, you guys have been just absolutely lights out on engaging the conversation. Engage this. Mm -hmm. Does profit matter? And when you look at earnings shortfalls, can you partition companies that are going to still make the bacon from those that are really challenged? Uh, yeah, but what the market, you know, uh, really reacts to. So if you just overlay upgrades, downgrades, or the change in forward estimates in the S&P 500, you'll see these pretty tight fit, not over the last couple of months where the market's, you know, way lower. Uh, and, and, and so earnings estimates do matter. Keep in mind that, uh, you know, every earnings season, the S&P 500, you know, beats on earnings by about 5%. So it's, you know, not something that the market reacts to in a big way, but, you know, persistent period of sort of downgrades is going to be an overhang for the market. And what I would say about the bottom-up consensus is, while the headline numbers, you know, look okay for mid-cycle or early cycle, uh, it, it, they do not look right for late cycle, where our house view, the consensus of economists is for growth to slow. And as growth slows next year, you know, earnings will come down. So um, and in addition, we have, you know, sort of uh, the, the, the pandemic hangover, as I would call it, built into consensus estimates mm -hmm. for mega cap growth in tech, you know, which got boosted by the pandemic. And the consensus has them rising with trend, even though they are currently 20 percent above trend levels. Uh, and staying there would be hard. I'm struggling here with mm -hmm. this idea that we're going to get earnings downgrades. We're seeing the end of free money. We're seeing real yields on the 10 year go up to 0.8 percent after having been deeply negative just three months ago. Mm -hmm. And all of this is going to somehow end the S&P at a 4750 at the end of the year. What gets us there? Yeah. So I, I, I think the key question is basically, are we going to go into a recession? You know, I, I, we've been uh, arguing for some time that the outlook looks pretty binary. We would get down to about 3650. We are kind of almost there already. And then it looks pretty binary whether we go into a recession or we don't. Recessions are pretty nonlinear events is the way I would talk about would think about them. Uh, it is not about uh, temporarily negative growth. It's really about corporates becoming risk averse. Not great, you know, signs yet, but take a look at uh, CEO confidence. Um, it's down. Uh, 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 I think the consumer confidence so, numbers get more, you know, sort of uh, attention, but uh, corporate CEO confidence down too. Just real quick here then, what's your bear case? My bear case is uh, if we go into a recession, we have a target of 3,000, which would basically be in the upper range of uh, typical recession drawbacks uh, 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 or pullbacks. Uh, 
you know, a, a, a recession declines uh, in hindsight uh, were extremely well explained basically by initial va valuations and uh, the severity of the recession. So if you use, you know, a typical recession, you know, year-on-year -year quarterly decline in earnings of 2021% and where we were uh, uh, valued initially before uh, uh, the pullback began, you know, you're talking about 35 to 40%, which would take us to basically 3,000 from the peak. So, Pinky, just to be clear, if Matt Lazzetti's right, it's 3K on the S&P? Uh, no, if Matt Lazzetti is right, uh, that there is no recession uh, right now, and uh, 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 that issue gets uh, resolved in the markets, and the market starts to price that out, right. then we get uh, 4750 by year end. Um, if uh, uh, we do slide into a recession, we, we are talking about uh, 3,000 on the S&P, Typical recession, assuming it starts now, is about 11 months. So you would get a bottom 3,000 around November. And, you know, you would get to 4750 by May of next year since the market typically starts to, you know, uh, uh, st bottoms basically halfway through. You know? Okay. Good to clear that up, Vicky. Thank you. Vicky Chatter of Deutsche Bank, still very, very constructive <clears throat> on this equity market, Lisa, looking out through the rest of this year. I just am looking at what will drive this. Will it be big tech? If it's not big tech, can the market compensate for it in every other sector, considering how I, far they have to go? And then big tech, what's the argument there if earnings are softening somewhat and you see real yields? Again, this was one of the biggest argument. There was no alternative other than the cash flow there. Suddenly, there is an alternative. You are getting yield on an inflation-adjusted basis, and that changes the equation for a lot of investors. And what did you make of the big bull, Marco Kalanovic? Out earlier this week <laughs> from JP Morgan. You saw what Sticking I said. Sticking to the script. What did you say? Water is wet and Marco Kalanovic is bullish. He's still bullish. At the same time, he's saying that the, the Fed will surprise dovishly relative to what is now priced. Mike John. Faroli looking for 75 basis points today, Tom, from the Federal Reserve. If I said what Bramo said there, I'd be up on HR. For her, it's just normal Bramo snark. Futures up a half of 1% on the S&P. Bramo's a columnist, Water? Tom. She, she can, <laughs> Lisa can say these I'll, things. I'll, I'll, Lisa can say I'll things that we later. cannot say. And Marco is bullish. Yielded down 10 basis points. Find that column from Lisa Brown. It's later <laughs> this weekend on Sunday. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. U.S. Democrats appear to be considering new energy legislation. Sources say Oregon Senator Ron Wyden may propose a surtax of up to 42% on companies that record a profit margin better than 10%. Democrats in the White House are struggling to curb U.S. energy costs and broader inflation. China's economy had a mixed recovery in May as COVID-19 restrictions eased, with industrial production increasing whilst consumer spending and the property market contracted. Industrial output rose 0.7% from a year ago, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, whilst the almost 7% contraction in retail sales was better than the prior month surge. The UK has cancelled its first flight, deporting asylum seekers to Rwanda. The European Court of Human Rights blocked the deportation, saying there's a risk of irreversible harm for the asylum seekers. The government says it is trying to discourage the work of human smugglers, but the policy has been condemned by UK rights groups and some lawmakers. The European Central Bank's governing council is ready to step in if it considers moves in government bond markets to be unjustified, according to Belgium's Pierre Wunsch, who said the group is open to taking action if markets are overreacting. The ECB is holding an emergency meeting to discuss a recent sell-off in government bonds. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. lives about reckless spending we're changing people's lives and because of the fact this year we're delivering the biggest drop in deficit in the history of the united states of america president biden speaking at the afl cio convention with some pretty firm words tip for you there lisa at home if you spend 10 times as much last year and then spend just five times as much as the year before this year, get a drop in the deficit, and then you can say you're saving money. 
<laughs> Are you trying to give uh, some advice to the White House? life advice at home. No, for you. I'm taking that advice from the White House. So I'm going to present a financial statement <clears throat> to the family tonight, and I will try to a offer that up. massive deficit sort of, yeah. for the family spending Thank you. one year, and then just a slightly narrower, smaller one the following year. Still a deficit, of course, and you can say a biggest drop in the deficit ever. Features Household finances. Up a half of 1% on the S&P, up six tenths of 1%. Pretty angry President Biden in the last couple of days. We'll talk about that in a moment. Up six tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq 100, down 11 basis points on a 10-year time, 336. For those of you just tuning in, we understand the ECB had an unscheduled meeting, standard about 5 Eastern. We also understood that would take about two hours. We haven't had any signal, Tom, whether that's wrapped yeah. up yet, and no statement either. So waiting for the outcome of that as they try and do something about the European bond market. We don't do speculation or rumors, but we do follow the Bloomberg. I've got Sterling breaking out a little bit stronger, but the others are all stuck within what the technical people, John, call pennants. And we really haven't seen a uh, breakout in euro dollar and other indicators uh, that we may get out of the CCB meeting. Just because of this, let's go back to Maria today on Brussels before Anne-Marie Horner. In, uh, in Washington. Uh, Maria, we're waiting for the ECB to say something. What are we waiting for? Yes, we are, Tom. And, and, and this meeting is different to the normal policy meetings. That's why we don't have clear guidance in terms of when is this going to finish. It should have been, in principle, uh, already done. We don't know what kind of statement we get after it or if we get anything on, on paper. You know, the idea is that there will be something on it. I think, uh, Tom, if you look at uh, the core of the issue right now for the European bond market, it really is about the fragmentation. And it's how do you fight this? And Christine Lagarde, a week ago in that press conference, she said four times we're committed to fight in that but gave no details. Yesterday, Isabel Schnabel, and this is someone that in Europe, when she speaks, when she tweets, when she writes, people do pay a lot of attention. She said, our commitment has no limits. I think this meeting is about specifics. No limits, but what does it mean? And that's exactly what the market uh, is hoping uh, to get from this right. very unscheduled last minute meeting that <clears throat> dropped like a bomb on investors today. And Marie, there's going to be an unscheduled meeting that drops like a bomb at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It's such a cacophony right now. Witness the president's comments to AFL-CIO. I, I, I mean, what's the next meeting? What's the marginal meeting look like at the White House? You mean a meeting between his aides or a meeting you, you that me. he's having with outsiders? Well, I mean, today he's doing an event to mark uh, the Pride Month. I think what really the frustration you have, and you saw a little bit of that on display yesterday, is what the president calls the bane of his existence, which is inflation. So I would note two things. One is that he has penned a letter now to a number of top oil companies, Chevron, Exxon, Marathon, Petroleum, talking about refining capacity. And you can see the president's frustration in this letter. I'll bring you a little bit. He's talking about the crunch that families are facing deserve immediate action. He wants yeah. them to take actions. And he's saying, your companies need to work with my administration to bring forward concrete near-term solutions. So I would say he's also punting this as well to Secretary Granholm of Energy. She's going to be having an emergency meeting to talk Talk about there refining we go. capacity. Right. Yeah, there well, we have it. Well, and Marie, <laughs> with, a lot of with the energy companies, but there's really not much the administration can do to alleviate the pain and the pump in the near term. And if you looked at the IEA report today, it is going to be higher for longer into 2023. And Marie, yes, there are emergency meetings. A lot of people, even including within the administration, have tiptoed around the idea that the stimulus was too big last year, that this was one of the drivers mm -hmm. of inflation. And this has been really uh, something that's been hanging over the administration. Have we gotten a sense of whether it would be better politically for them just to capitulate on that and to talk directly to that point? Well, I think it depends who you ask, right? You have Secretary Yellen really with a mea culpa saying we got the path of inflation wrong. That surprised a lot of individuals at the White House. At the same time, yesterday you had David Weston interview Barhat Ramaroti, and what he said was that middle-class American families would have been worse off 
if it wasn't for that package that many economists, including the likes of Larry Summers, have taken aim at the administration saying that was going to inflate the economy and it was just too much. And there is a lot of questions surrounding this regarding Secretary Yellen because there's a biography about her that has yet to be released that really signals that she was the one really waving her hand saying this might be too high and this might increase inflationary pressures. We also have a fantastic story in this week's Business Week by my colleague Saleh Mosin talking about the fact that the administration had begged Treasury Secretary Yellen to really take that job. And what has emerged is a pattern of her being sidelined. In the first nine months, sources telling Saleya that Ron Klain had really kept her out of some of these huddles where Treasury had a stake. And this is, wherever your politics are, many regard Janet Yellen as one of the most brilliant minds in the economic world. Uh, so there's a lot of questions facing the policies of this administration, the path they've taken, and what we are dealing with now is inflation north of 8%. Without a doubt, and Anne-Marie, I think you, na you nailed it with a couple of words there. Policy, policy versus politics. She's a mm -hmm. fantastic, fantastic economist. When it comes to politics, Secretary Yellen will sit in that hearing and say it's not price gouging. The other people in the administration will run around saying it's price gouging. That's the problem they have right now, isn't it? So I've been asking this question for a while. What is the future of Secretary Yellen? If you have that sharp economist, one of the best labor market economists on the planet in the administration, not getting invited to the meetings at the White House to talk about economics, that just seems utterly bizarre. It does seem bizarre. And, it, and you question this. Why are they not bringing her in more and relying on her more? Listen, she is an economist. She was the head of the U.S. Central Bank, the head of the Fed. This is someone who doesn't like the political aspect of the job. You can just tell that, like you said, listening to her in the hearings, right? So maybe others in the past have just wrestled their way into the West Wing, something she's not going to do. But a question is, why is she not invited? And Marie, thank you. AMH down in Washington, D.C., alongside Maria Tadeo. Waiting for a conclusion of this ECB meeting. Just saw this from Stuart Hampton out on Twitter. Visco, the Italian central bank governor, must have locked the doors. That's a joke. No confirmation of that whatsoever. Just in case anyone took that seriously. Tom, for instance. Futures up 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up about 6 tenths of 1%. Yields lower by 11 basis points from New York. This is Bloomberg. Mixing things up for you, a day of gains potentially, a morning of them so far anyway, after five days of losses on the S&P, futures positive eight tenths of 1% on the S&P 500, on the Nasdaq 100 up around about 1%. Previous five days talked about it a lot. Over the last five days, this equity market on the S&P down more than 10 percent. The bond market, big moves too. You know them well. A two-year yield up 70 basis points in five days. Climbing, 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 retreating this morning, down about 12, 13 basis points. On a two-year, on a 10-year, down 11 basis points to 336.20. Looking back to where we were last year, 12 months ago, two-year yield in and around 20 basis points. Big <clears> change to where we are right now at 331. If you look at the move we've seen in Italy, similar kind of story. We've gone from 50 basis points last summer to 380 right now, even with a 36 basis point decline on a session so far. Why the big move in Europe, if you're just tuning in? We've had an unscheduled ECB meeting that started about two hours and 30 minutes ago. We have not had a statement or any indication that that meeting has concluded just yet, but you know what the goal is, the objective, to set out how, Tom, they're going to stop Italian yields from breaking out even higher. And if you look at the spread, the difference between a German 10-year and the Italian 10-year, that was inside 100 basis points last summer, broke out to about 240 right. basis points in the last 24 hours, and just inside 220 at the moment. Big changes going on in this bond market over the last day and the yeah. last year as well. And for our American listeners and viewers, this is really critical. And John, you lived this early in your Bloomberg career. Europe is different. I love Ben Emmons' note this morning where he talks, John, about the European doom loop, which is how the EU banks are linked much more into the price of EU paper. And the answer is the EU aggregate Bloomberg index is down 17%. 
that's a price decline of 17% that that's emergency meetings dealing with. Monetary policy, Tom, in Europe transmits much more so through the banking channel than yeah. through markets, because that's where a lot of the funding is done. It's different, say, to the United States of America. Impairing monetary policy is the key phrase here that the ECB president used last week, Christine Lagarde. And right now, Tom, what's happening in Italy, in their words, their minds, threatens to impair monetary policy. They have what's called an existential threat, Tom. That's what it is. We all talk about mandates as central banks. The ECB, number one, is not the inflation targeting story, Tom. It's the existential threat to the Eurozone. That is much, much easier to address when inflation is low and you can go max dovish, President Draghi. Much, much harder to address when you're set to raise interest rates because inflation is too high. And that's the dilemma that this ECB president faces today and will continue to face yeah. through the rest of this year. Euro dollar right now just south of 105, at 104.84. Positive six tenths of 1%, seeing some euro strength, seeing some G10 strength against the weaker dollar. That's the cross asset price action. Let's get you some single names, some movers. We can do that with Bramo. Hey, Lisa. Hey, John. So, right now, the single stock moves really are a macro story as well. What we're seeing is people trying to find a bottom, trying to retrace some of the losses that we've seen. And the biggest losses now mean the biggest gainers ahead of the market. We can see the Apple shares up a tenth, uh, almost a percent. You can see the Amazon up more than that. Meta is is the biggest gainer here and I think that's interesting because Facebook has been down more than 50 percent so far year to date it's up one and a half percent people trying to find a bottom trying to see value in the sell-off we'll see if it holds yesterday it did not today a very volatile session no doubt given the Fed uncertainty if we take a look at the area that is not doing well it is having to do with crypto amid this crypto winter as some people yeah, have we... talked about it and Coinbase in particular I'm keeping my eye on down another 2% ahead of the open. And it was down much more than that. Tom, we talked yesterday all about how Coinbase came out and said that they were going to cut 18% of their staff because the adoption just wasn't there from the institutions. And I'm struck by the people who left big Wall Street firms to go work for a place like Coinbase, which is an exchange for crypto assets. And we're told they don't have a job anymore because this market is changing that quickly. The other Bitcoin props proxies and crypto proxies also all down across the board, although they are coming back a little bit. Again, how much are people trying to sort of bottom feed or figure out when the losses are done? Yeah. And Tom, urge, that's what I'm looking for. I, or Lisa, I urge everybody to go to all these names we don't know anything about and read their websites. Riot Chain. Is it, Riot, Riot Blockchain. Riot that's down four Blockchain. Tenths of a is endeavoring to be the driver of the future of American mining in Bitcoin. I know They're that you're endeavoring. skeptical, Tom. People were uh, <laughs> thinking that this could potentially be a market. Yeah. And I'm really excited to speak with Peter Shear later in the show because he has come out and said there, there is go. a systemic risk to this, given all the energy that goes into producing crypto assets, given how much investment has gone in to creating the ecosystem, and that that's all evaporating at the same time that retail investors are losing their shirts. There has uh, some systemic importance right. of that, Tom. Uh, the finance minister, France John, just out with a headline, avoiding fragmentation is euro area priority. We learned a lot from that, didn't we, John? Uh, not really, eh? So much okay, sense of let's get to in your it. voice. Let's get to it and try within an emergency ECB meeting and a Fed meeting coming up in our coverage this afternoon. Amanda Lynham with us. She's global credit strategist at Goldman Sachs. How have you changed your thinking, Amanda, in the last five hours, given an emergency meeting of a major central bank? Good morning, Tom. Thanks for having me. Um, so look, at, we're responding to the very dynamic environment you saw earlier this week. We marked our spread forecast wider again uh, to reflect an additional rebuild of risk premia through the second half of this year. Tom, you alluded to earlier in the show about the significant decline in bond prices yes, please. across the IG and high yield markets. Um, that's that's almost entirely been driven by the move in rates. The point that we emphasized earlier this week is that if you were to take spreads and look at them relative to the post-financial crisis period, they're still hovering around the median. I, I so agree. I totally, yeah, so Amanda, I totally agree with the spread analysis, but help mere mortals that aren't in yeah. the sophisticated spread market of Amanda yes. Lynham, 
You're telling me price decline doesn't matter? I'm sweating. I'm losing we're, money, we're, right? <laughs> we're saying that it, it they both matter. And so the, the, the lack of widening on the spread basis introduces a vulnerability into the corporate bond market that hasn't yet repriced to reflect the very narrowness of the soft landing that our economists ultimately expect. And so while it's true that bond valuations have repriced significantly lower because of the rate volatility, we still have yet to see spreads truly reflect the very challenging growth, inflation, and policy risks in the corporate bond market. And that's true in both the US and in Europe. So what we did earlier this week is we marked our spread forecast further um, wide to reflect that additional rebuild of risk premia. Um, and, and really that's that's reflective of, of a very challenging macro backdrop. Now, as you know, our economists are still um, you know, not viewing a recession as their base case, but, but clearly financial conditions continue to tighten. Investors are needing to digest an even more hawkish monetary policy stance. And we also see some room for credit to catch down to equities. So I mentioned that if you just looked at credit spreads in isolation, they haven't sold off that much, yeah. even relative to cross yeah. assets. They haven't sold Lisa, off is this year's word catch down? Can we make a decision on that in June or do we have to wait till late autumn? That'll be the subject of our surveillance meeting later today after our uh, second round of shows. Are you trying to kid? There's a meeting for the show. <laughs> well, no yeah. one believes there's a meeting for everyone, the show between everyone the three is fully, of us. fully aware of that. Amanda, how do you price in or how do you factor in liquidity risk at the same time as trying to understand recession risk at a time when a lot of people are saying there just yeah. is no trading. If you want to sell, you'll catch no bids. Right, right. Um, so I, I remember maybe a couple of months ago, we were having a conversation where we were seeing flashing yellow signs of, of liquidity in the corporate bond market. Those have further intensified. There are a range of, of metrics that we track, bid ask spreads, um, certain liquidity measures, intraday volatility. They're all starting to pick up, whether you look at them on kind of a, a five day moving average basis or somewhat longer, and definitely over the past few trading sessions, very indicative of kind of what we're seeing real time. I think from, for some investors, they're using it as an opportunity to step in and provide liquidity to the market. But absolutely, I think uh, it's a very challenging macro backdrop. And, and in Wait. addition to the fundamental pictures, the, the liquidity backdrop has, has further exacerbated. Amanda, that. just 30 seconds here. But would you step in to this liquidity uh, absence? Would you say this is a good time or not because of that expectation yeah, for spreads to widen further? Yeah, selectively to be up in quality. I think, um, you know, we've really emphasized that we're preferring IG over high yield in both the U.S. and European markets. I think in the near term, high yield versus leverage loans is a bit more of a balanced risk reward. We had previously been overweight high yield. We tweaked that earlier this week to be Become neutral between the two, still prefer US over Europe. So I think selectively you could deploy some capital, but to be very clear, we do expect a continued rebuild of risk premia through year end. And so I think it's important to stay up in quality, strong pricing power, companies that you know don't have the vulnerabilities on the supply chain, labor shortages, cost inflation, that will be very important. Amanda, thank you. One of the best. Brilliant. Awesome Brilliant. to catch up. Brilliant. Amanda Lynham there of Goldman Sachs on a credit market on this Fed decision day. <clears throat> Haven't talked about it much this morning. Retail sales. 8.30 Eastern time. I, I really... 8.30 Eastern time, I, I, Lisa. Even ba barely even discussed, not even on the radar for so many people as they look ahead to the Fed. And just in terms of the Fed, just to get everyone up to speed on the survey that Bloomberg puts out, we put all together, put together all these forecasts, these estimates from all these economists on Wall Street. Median still 50 basis points today. But as Mike McKee pointed out to me earlier this morning, Lisa, most of the new forecasts, if you go inside the Bloomberg and look at how they're dated, the old forecasts are 50. Most of the new ones have lent towards this idea we get 75. I'm struck by what Dominic Costum of Mizuho said earlier on the show, that it would be a negative for markets, a bigger negative, if they do not go 75 basis points. This is a Fed credibility issue, John, and how much is that going to be the main discussion point through the remainder of the day? Speaking of credibility, the ECB meeting, Tom, still haven't got an outcome from that meeting. I'm just sitting there what refreshing outcome? monetary okay, policy seriously. decisions on the ECB website, waiting for this statement to drop. You know, Chairman Powell's having his Pop-Tarts and Tang down at the Eccles building. Is that what he asked, what? Tom? Yeah, it does. On decision day. Yeah, yeah we talked about it once. I, I, I want to know, John, what outcome are we expecting? From the ECB. Seriously. From the ECB, I'll tell you what people want to see. I have no idea what we will see. What they want to see is a detailed plan, a vehicle, a mechanism an outline of how they intend to cap Italian bond yields. 
And what's clear oh, to me is this on. idea of just reinvesting Pep selectively. I'm not sure if that gets it done, but exactly. ultimately, Tom, the market will decide. The market will I, decide. It's yield up, price down. I think that's the way it works. And that's been the story of the last couple of weeks, Tom, in this bond market, that's for sure. Not today. Yields are lower by 11 or 12 basis points on a 10-year, 335.62. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Global oil supply will struggle to meet rising demand next year, which means consumers will continue to face tight fuel markets, according to the International Energy Agency in its first assessment of 2023. The forecast says a resurgent Chinese economy will bolster consumption, whilst tighter sanctions on Russian will cut oil output. European energy consumers are bracing for even higher prices due to possible disruptions to supply from Russia and the US. Western sanctions have left a turbine for the Nord Stream pipeline stuck in Canada. And Gazprom has reduced flows to Germany through Nord Stream by 40%. A longer than expected outage at a US LNG terminal also added to price pressures. A vague tweet by a founder of Three Arrows Capital, an influential hedge fund that has been liquidating crypto holdings as prices have plummeted, is creating new apprehension in the industry. Former Credit Suisse group trader Su Zhu tweeted his group was, quote, fully committed to working this out without providing further details. There's been no further comment from Zhu. Heavy rain and rapid snow melt at Yellowstone National Park triggered flooding that tore out bridges and damaged nearby homes. The raging waters may force roadways that were partially torn away to be rebuilt elsewhere. The unprecedented flooding drove more than 10,000 visitors out of the nation's oldest national park, which could stay closed for a week. Nobody reported was hurt. Global News 24 hours a day. On air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I don't think the whole crypto uh, economy is going to collapse, nor do I think blockchain is going to disappear. I don't think people are going to basically abandon the whole concept of cryptocurrencies just because the market's down for the last couple of weeks. David Rubenstein there, the co-chairman, co-founder of the Carlyle Group from New York City this morning. Good morning. It is Fed Decision Day and apparently ECB Decision Day as well, believe it or not. An unscheduled meeting a little bit earlier this morning, set to last two hours. It's been two hours, 50 minutes since that meeting started and no sign of what the outcome was. If indeed there has been an outcome. Futures up seven tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. It's a turnaround in this bond market, down 11 basis points at 336. Barely a bite, Tom, barely a bite out of what we've seen so far. Interestingly, for anyone who's following the detail of this, we haven't seen the outcome of this governing council meeting, but one member of the governing council, the Portuguese chief of the central bank speaking in Lisbon, is delivering a presentation right now, Tom. Remarks I, on Portuguese yeah. growth, which is kind of bizarre, right? Because we still don't know what the outcome of that meeting was. We're going to contrib continue to attribute this, folks. And what we can say is Bloomberg reports uh, that Mr. Centeno is speaking, there's a, something about Bank of Portugal forecast. We need to be very careful. It doesn't look to me yet like markets are moving, John. I've got no, Euro 104.69. Just saying it's strange, Tom, that we haven't seen yeah. a statement from the ECB meeting I, that we were told took place this morning, yet one of the members yeah. of the governing council is out there doing a presentation in Lisbon. Yeah, I'm looking at weaker Euro over the last couple of minutes for those at Global Wall Street. You know, I, 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 I look at it like the ECB is probably using the Peter Cheer method, which is make it up as you go. Peter Cheer joins us right now, head of macro strategy and making it up as you go at Academy uh, Securities as well. Peter, not a snarky question, but a serious one. Is the bond market right now the central banker of the United States of America? Yeah, I think the bond market's really in control of things, and I'm increasingly nervous that the lack of liquidity in the bond market is letting us move too far too quickly. And unless we kind of tame inflation, get some of this under control, I think we're at a real risk of much higher yields, especially with what's going on in Europe, right? The Italian and Spanish yields are leading the way there, but that's dragging global yields around too. Does it happen quickly or does it happen all at once, right? I mean, we've seen a real quick repricing, but do we see something that is a gap higher that gets the Fed's attention that is driven by low liquidity and a sense of uncertainty around both Fed policy and how high yields could go? 
Yeah, I would not be surprised if we get one of those crazy days where you get a two or three point move in the long bond, largely due to a lack of liquidity and positioning. I'm not sure which direction it would go. I would have thought a month ago is going to be a gap to lower yields. Now it feels like if we get a gap, it's going to be a dislocation and a you know air pocket move to a much higher yield. It'll probably be temporary, but it will disrupt markets. We haven't talked about Bitcoin very much in this show, Peter, and it's by design. It's something that we don't normally cover, yet the losses have been shocking. And you made a point yesterday, Peter, that really struck me, that there is a systemic import to the losses in the cryptocurrency complex, that it feeds into the larger market in a way that perhaps some people are not expecting. Do you still think that that's the case, that it could be a systemic risk, both economically and on a market basis? Yeah, and I've been thinking about this a lot, and I think there's kind of two main groups of crypto investors. They're the relatively small, aggressive people who I think may get wiped out. I think they were using a lot of margin. That will have some impact on the economy, but I don't think a huge one. The other part is very wealthy people who tended to, I think, view cryptocurrencies as a core part of their asset classes or their asset allocation. They also tended to invest heavily in disruptive stocks, and then they use some of the big tech almost as their equivalent of a bank account. So I think they were very aggressively positioned and that's getting unwound right now. So I think there's going to be a potential for a huge wealth effect. And as you start looking at the amount of spending that was going on in advertising for crypto, the number of conferences, the number of jobs that were created, the number of semiconductors that were bought to support crypto, if the slowdown is real, and I think it is, I think we're going to hit maybe even 10,000 on Bitcoin, you could see a knock-on effect into the economy that we would not have thought about two or three years Why? ago. Why am I going to see a knock-on effect into the economy, Peter? Because I think this wealth creation has hit stocks, this disruptive stocks in particular, big tech. There's less money. These people were spending money. You're going to see a cut down on conferences. You're going to see less spending on the rigs that are required to make, you know, do the mining. The one offshoot of this that might be good for us is lower energy costs as crypto stock, you know, becomes less of a drain on energy. But I, I think we're going to be surprised how impactful crypto is, especially to the New York area and the California area, right. where the amount of money lost is painful. I mean, the accounting of this, Peter, I, I find extraordinary. If we go from 21,000 down to a Peter Cheer 10,000 or from 60 whatever thousand down to 10,000, I mean, that signals the collapse of the scheme, doesn't it? I think to a large degree, yes. And you know, I think the prior guest you mentioned had um, highlighted, oh, we're only down a couple of weeks. The reality is no one who's bought crypto in the last two years and held on to it is now up money. Yeah, so this had is... Almost all the yeah, I don't mean to interrupt, but folks, this is important because I got a lot of shade yesterday on David Rubenstein's comments. Lisa, jump in here because uh, you, you were part of that. Mr. Rubenstein made clear original founders of Bitcoin still are in a profit point. And Mr. Cheers saying, yeah, but in the last number of years... That's not true. People here have huge losses. Well, Bitcoin is emblematic of the withdrawal of free money. And we are seeing the end of a regime, Peter, and it will be exemplified by what we hear today at 2.30 p.m. from Fed Chair Jay Powell. What do you think that he could do to create some calm, a greater backdrop of certainty to a market that has had anything but? I think he's going to try and shock the system. I now think he's going to give us 75 bips. I think the market will probably react well to that initially on the view that, OK, they're going to try and get ahead of this inflation. And then I think over the course of the next couple of days, the sad reality will sink in is we are going to deal with much higher short term rates. That's going to you know, slow down the economy. And just briefly back to Bitcoin, I think one thing that's also important is we're starting to see the system gum up. Right. You had Celsius kind of block withdrawals. You had Luna Terra had these problems. So you've had this kind of collection of networks that all kind of work together. I think people are really going to question that. And if you go back to when Lehman collapsed, right, we talked about the Lehman moment. It was never a moment. It was just part of a process. And I think the gumming up of the system is going to create a lack of trust. And a lot of people who are sitting out there 20,000, yeah, maybe they bought at 5,000, but better to get out at 20 than 10. So I think that's the problem there. And I do think the Fed's message of fighting inflation today will push crypto lower as well. Pete, you're one of the best. I love hearing from you. Just wonderful to catch up. Peter Cheer there of Academy breaking things down for us. Try and break this down. This is bizarre with the ECB this morning. They've scheduled an unscheduled meeting. By definition, I guess it is now scheduled. It took place early this morning at 5 a.m. Eastern time. We were told it would last about two hours. We had a couple of scheduled ECB speakers today, one of which is the Portuguese central bank chief. He was due to speak at about 7.30 Eastern time. He started his remarks. He started his remarks to deliver a presentation that was already previously scheduled. But, Tom, it's strange because we still haven't found, found out the outcome I, I of what the ECB meeting... I, was this morning? I think 
And this is unusual, folks. Just a bit. In crisis for central banks. They're truly making it up as they go. Let me look at this chart, John. I rarely do this on Bloomberg Surveillance, but today is so historically unusual. Uh, This is, uh, well, that's the euro chart. That's not the one I wanted. But the bottom line, John, to your observation, things changed June 9. And what I can tell you is the standard deviation move and the so-called convexity from June 9 is shocking. And that's why you're having this emergency meeting. And we're waiting for the details, the outcome of that meeting. Bizarre. Futures at 1% on the S&P from New York City on this central bank decision day. This is Bloomberg. Hike in interest rates that we're seeing from all the central banks around the world, except for the Japanese, is going to slow growth. This is full on demand destruction. We got to slow the economy. Maybe we touch recession. People have just been calling this peak of inflation. We say you can't call a peak until the peak is over. You know, look at the consumer. They're continuing to spend. They're starting to eat into their savings. That is a risk that we're watching. So there are cracks in the consumer. It could be a tough couple of months here. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlett, and Tom Keen on radio, on television. An absolutely extraordinary Fed day. The ECB gets out front of Jerome Powell and holds an emergency meeting of a, what we've reported is mystery. John, all we can do is look at Euro dollar, which moments ago began to give way from the enthusiasms of the morning. We're assuming they get out in front, Tom. We're still waiting for a statement. I've got no idea when that's going to come or if indeed it will come. For the ECB, it's about numbers, Tom. The spread between Italy and Germany last year, last summer, was inside 100 basis points. Yesterday, it threatened to blast through 250 and beyond. That's a problem for this ECB. And it is the banking problem as well. Very different than in uh, America. John, I am thunderstruck they're doing this meeting out front of the Federal Reserve of the United States. What are they going to do, Tom? Wait and wait to see what happens with the Federal Reserve meeting it again. Maybe. See Why more not? punishment. They're seeing the outcome of their meeting <laughs> last week in this bond market front and centre. It's the F word, the one they're worried about, right. fragmentation. And they know the detail that they put out last week to address that potential fragmentation is not enough because this market needs to see a whole lot more. Uh, where's Lagarde on this, John? And we really haven't addressed that this morning. We can make maybe Mario Draghi called for Italy no or idea. the Bundesbank stepped in. But where is Christine Lagarde, the politician? I can tell you this, Tom. She came out at the very beginning of the pandemic. Do you remember that line? We're not here to close spreads. <clears throat> yeah. Guess what? Apparently we are. And apparently we are even with inflation at 8% and even as we try to hike interest rates. And they're the contradictory goals of this ECB that they've got to try and grapple with. How do you thread that needle? I said this morning with Lisa, I think we're all on the same page. Chairman Powell, that's not a tough job relative to President Lagarde this morning. I think President Lagarde has got a much, much more difficult one in front of her. We make jokes about it. I get in about 5.52, folks. John gets in a couple minutes before me. Abramowitz is in here at 2 a.m. working the charts. Lisa, where is the elasticity in the bond market uh, right now of price down, yield up? Which bond, which spread matters? I've been watching investment grade bonds, corporate bonds, because they have seen absolute uh, blowout when it comes to how much they've been hammered. All in, the aggregate index is down nearly 20% since the peak last year. The issue people have is when do we get market dysfunction? At what point is a lack of liquidity and a lack of buyers going to be a concern to the way things and the flow of money that happens in markets? Tom, we're not quite there yet, but people are watching this closely and how the Fed may respond to it today. Let's get back on Fed script. We will have the Fed show for you this afternoon. William Dudley scheduled to be with us. John Farrow, just in the last 24 hours, 75 beeps heard much more often. Oh, Tom Barclays, Deutsche Bank, Goldman, Jeffries, JP Morgan, Namora, Sogjen, take your pick. All the new forecasts I've seen in the last 24 hours, all suggesting 75 basis points. Tom, that's the timeline. I want to understand if people think the destination has changed. Is this a Fed that not only has to do more up front, front loading, but also has to go higher 
further down the road. Has that view changed in the last couple of days? Absolutely historic day. Stay with us, Global Wall Street, and all of you interested in the effects of this on all of our life. John, let me do the data check, uh, get it started for you. Euro dollar 104.56, weaker euro in the last 20 minutes. This equity market reeling from the moves we've seen in the last five days. Five days on the S&P, five days lower. Over those five days, down more than 10% on the S&P 500. Much of this sparked by the inflationary read that we're getting from the economic data. That sparked a monster move at the front end of the curve and pushing right the way through the Treasury curve too. 70 basis points higher on a two-year yield in just five days. This morning, we take a bite out of it, but not much. Yields are lower by 10 yeah. basis points on a 10-year, Tom, 337. <clears throat> Yeah, I like that idea of take a bite out of it. Right now, let's get a macro strategy view. He's with State Street, but with decades of experience, Lee Farage. Lee, are you just steeled right now that there will be major market moves within the Powell press conference? Yes, I mean, I think it's hard to avoid that conclusion. Look, I mean, as you mentioned, nearly everyone's going for 75 now. Um, you know, if that was the plan to get that, that view out into the market, then it's worked. Um, so in theory, we're priced for the 75, but the message is going to be very important. As you say, you know, is this going to be a 75, but, but you know, we're just getting ahead of things, or is it a 75 and we're going to carry on uh, and it's going to be a hawkish message? I think it's the latter. I think Powell is, is going to come with a 75 and a very hawkish message. They're worried about inflation expectations getting de-anchored. Um, you know, not only do we have that CPI on Friday, we also saw the rise in inflation expectations as well. They're very worried about consumer inflation expectations. That's why the message is going to be a tough one, I think. Lee, we know historically in recent history, life on cable around 120 is not sustainable. Life on euro dollar around parity is not sustainable. Lee, how important is the FX channel and how do you think this is going to play out through it? as the Fed looks to go big, the ECB and the Bank of England look set to respond. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's trying to pick a top in this dollar move. I mean, you know, and, and from a valuation point of view, I can see it from the, how far we've moved. I can see it as well. But the fact is that we're in for a tough couple of months in markets. You've got, at the same time, you've got stubborn inflation. It went up even further. That's not going to show signs of easing anytime soon, we think. At the same time, the real economic data is deteriorating and you've got a very, very hawkish Fed. That's a really bad background for, backdrop for asset markets. And when equities sell off, you want to be in the dollar. That's, that's the bottom line. Um, and, you know, people keep wanting to pick a top in the dollar. We saw it in May and they got their fingers burned. And, and this is going to carry on being the trade. For me, you've still got to stay long of the dollar. I agree with you at Cable at 120. You know what, but Jonathan... We haven't been through Brexit before. We're not starting to see what we're seeing now. You know, the data out of the UK is, is getting really, really worrisome. And yes, the Bank of England want to respond in kind, but they're in an even tighter situation than the Fed, quite honestly. So I can see cable carrying on going lower. I mean, 120 historically, yes, but we saw 115 in March 2020. Yeah. I can get us below that. How much confidence, Lee, do you have that Italy will have some sort of containment of those yields, that the ECB will come out with a plan that will actually create some calm? Would you be shorting Italian bonds here or would you be buying them? They'll come out with something eventually. Whether they do it today or not, we've seen this in the past with the ECB. <clears throat> they recognize what the problem is and they try and tackle it in a sort of, in, 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 in the, a minimal way if they can. And then eventually they're forced to doing something more dramatic. I, I suspect this is the first of the stage of, of trying to, to, to tinker around the edges. Um, and then if the market continues to widen, the spreads continue to widen, which I think has got to be a real risk, we'll see more down the line. I still think we'll get All there. Right. We've seen it before. You're a weakening now halfway back, even more than halfway back to where it was at 1 a.m. this morning over e ECB emergency meeting enthusiasm. Lee Farage, you spent over a decade in the trenches of Treasury at Rabobank. You have lived EU banking and their linkage to bonds. Yet they've never seen bond price declines like this. I don't want you to speak for Rabobank or certainly State Street, but how do you view continental banking and bonds given these abrupt moves in price? As I said, the ECB will get there. They will control it. We've seen this in the past. We've, how many crises have we been through where we worry about the periphery? You know, you, you go back to Draghi and whatever it takes. We had a similar comment this morning 
um, from Schnorbel, that, that there are no limits. And, and they'll get there. They may not get there today, and we may see these spreads widen further, but the ECB will come up with a plan, and they will control these spreads. And the fact is, listen, if you don't think that Italy is going to leave the Eurozone, which I don't, then 4% yield is not unattractive. You get a 4.5%, maybe, maybe 5 That's not an unattractive yield. At some point, buyers will come back, but the ECB... As I say, they will come out with a plan, maybe not today, but they'll get there. We might have more pain in the interim, but they'll get there. We've seen it before. Lee Farage, thank you, sir, of State Street Morning. on a range of issues. Maybe a sub-115 <clears throat> cable move as well. Wow. Lisa, the ECB, and we talked about this before we came on air just for a minute. It's easier to address these issues, easier to address these issues when inflation is low. When inflation's at 8%, to address fragmentation, so-called fragmentation, that's a lot harder to do. How much did the soft landing scenario entirely rely on inflation data cooperating, which is out of the control of a lot of these central bankers? Without that cooperation of inflation, as you say, that is not high, how do they achieve threading this needle that seems contradictory? I keep trying to go to this, and I'd love people to write in on a Bloomberg, on Twitter, wherever you like. This FX channel is so, so important. When you hear these people talking about imported inflation, not everyone's going to win that FX game. And I keep looking at these moves, and if I was the ECB, I'd be really worried about not just what's happened in Italy, but what happened in the FX market as a consequence. Because the last thing you want is this doom loop between what happens with monetary policy, the bond market, and the currency going the other way, which is what the Bank of England faces too. And so far, this stronger dollar story, Lisa, maybe that does start to take a bite out of some of the inflation story for America, but for Europe, they're facing a weaker currency. For the UK, they're facing a weaker currency. That exacerbates the problem, which is why you and I have gone over this issue so many times over the last few months. The currency moves, are they positive or negative in response to higher interest rates at the ECB and the Bank of England? And at the moment, we're finding out. Just getting a couple of lines from the ECB. Comments in a statement following an emergency meeting. The pandemic has left lasting vulnerabilities in the Eurozone. That's the first line crossed on a Bloomberg. I'm waiting to see that statement on the ECB website. So we are getting a statement. They will apply flexibility in reinvesting PEP redemptions. What does that mean? That's one line. Looking for a little bit more detail here. The ECB instructing committees to prepare a new crisis tool. Can we get the Italian 10-year? And I would say, get rid of this commercial break, get rid of what we're about to do, sit on this story, dial back the music, and let's talk about this. The ECB instructing committees to prepare new crisis tools. Lisa, to me, at first look, and I want to go through that ECB statement, I don't see a plan here. I see a plan to make a plan yes. down the line. Well, this sounds very similar to what came out with the ECB meeting, yeah. where they said that they were going to maintain flexibility. You did see a knee-jerk reaction uh, a little bit in the BTPs. Uh, yields fluctuating around, but honestly, this is underwhelming at a time when people were looking for details. Without details, they could sit in a meeting. They knew this was a problem since June 9th. The fact that they really haven't come up with anything other than very similar language, John, uh, is, is indicative of the conundrum that they're in. Yields coming back a little bit, Tom. Still working our way through this. The Italian 10-year, 382, down 35 basis points on the day. Yeah, I, I'm looking for the statement here, John. I think I've got it coming up here now. The gerbil's working. I didn't pay the bill on the Bloomberg. Uh, I've got here. the statement, I've Tom. got the statement now in front of me, and uh, it's a short statement. Let's start with that. Based on this assessment, the Governing Council decided it will apply flexibility in reinvesting redemptions. We knew that. Excuse me. Um, they're going to mandate the rele relevant Euro system committees together with ECB services. You know, I had uh, Dr. Regling with me in Davos, John, who's the architect of emergency actions. And I wonder what Klaus Regling would say, uh, probably removed from this statement. And this is a really, really tough one. And what we're seeing in the Italian bond market is things slowly, as we start to work our way through this headlines and this statement, turn around. So today we had yields aggressively lower off the back of this idea there would be an unscheduled meeting. They would look to address some of this fragmentation concern and yields are going the other way now. Still lower on the session by a whole lot, by, by about 31 basis points on an Italian 10-year at 388, but certainly moving in the wrong direction, Aye. Lisa. 
again off the back of this? It's underwhelming. They need to come out with a plan. This is not a plan. This is reiterating that they're going to, as you said, John, come up with a plan. How do they even craft one at a time not only of political dissent on all sides, but also when they have to tighten financial conditions enough to suppress inflation if that is their goal? Otherwise, what is their goal with this tightening plan that they have? The challenge you have right now in this bond market, though, Lisa, as we start to erase some of the gains in the Italian 10-year is how far do you want to push this again, knowing that they are trying to come up with some kind of crisis tool? Do you question their ability to come up with one, something that would be effective? They've talked about no limits. Can they come up with something without limits that can address so-called fragmentation and simultaneously raise interest rates at the same time? Ultimately, the market is going to be the judge of this not us, and yields are turning the other way. But I wonder how far you would be willing to push this, Lisa, as the ECB has set out this morning to say we are preparing a new crisis tool. And Lee Farage was saying, don't fight the ECB. They will eventually find a way, and so he wouldn't bet against them. But this is the reason why, as you were saying before, the existential crisis of the euro. This goes to the cohesion in the euro area. If you do have this concern about a member state, but what is the political dissent within the ECB and, frankly, within the European Union that pushes back and says it's not our job uh, to take care of a country and their finances? On the flip side, they've been doing it for a long time, and so at what point does that cohesion cohesion uh, really take the dominant force. Happy to say that standing by is Maria Tadeo out of Brussels. Maria, you've read through the statement too. Your take on what's developing in Frankfurt, Germany this morning. Well, you know, to your question and consensus, you don't put out a statement like this. Frankly, you don't call a meeting like this if there isn't consensus. And uh, what is clear is that the, the governing council has now agreed, and this is what the market wanted, and they put it out on paper, that uh, they will accelerate the completion of a new tool that is designed to fragment or to deal with the fragmentation in the market. This is basically what investors out there, particularly in the European market, wanted to hear and had been wanting to hear for a week now, that this is not just an abstract term that the European Central Bank will fight fragmentation in the context of rate hikes, but actually put it on paper, something concrete. I think it also goes beyond uh, the initial idea in this meeting that this would be about reinvesting the PEP. So it does take it uh, to the next level. I, I guess if you're an investor yesterday, you had reasons to perhaps want to test uh, the European Central Bank to put it uh, to the test. What is the pain level that they were willing to tolerate today? But I think today, you know, this meeting in this context, uh, they actually provided more more than a lot of people were expecting when going into the meeting. They now say very clearly, we have to create a new tool. And that tool doesn't exist yet. And that's the problem for them at the moment. I have to say the bond market's pretty calm off the back of this. Euro dollars rolled over a fair bit, almost unchanged on the session now to 104.28. If you're just tuning in, you missed the whole of this morning. We've seen this massive move in the Italian bond market. You've all witnessed that over the last couple of days. Clearly, that got the attention of the ECB. They scheduled an unscheduled meeting, got together, sat around a table for two hours and had a discussion about what to do. They've reaffirmed something we've been talking about for weeks now, reinvesting PEP, but they go a step further, kinder. And it's the kinder that's going to shape this market this morning. Here's the kinder. The governing council decided to mandate the relevant euro system committees together with the ECB services to accelerate the completion of the design of a new anti-fragmentation instrument for consideration yeah. by the governing council. There's a few steps here, Tom. You've got to come up with the instrument. Then it's got to be approved by the governing council. I don't know how long that's going to take. And in between, I have no idea what's going to happen with the bond market either. Your Italian tenure this morning, 389. Yeah, John, I, I want to make clear, Euro moments ago, breaking through and breaching where we were at 1.18 a.m. Uh, New York time, and it's a weaker Euro. Basically, it's gone completely round trip on the strength of the hope of that meeting. So I, I do think that's really germane here with Euro 104.36. Maria, any indication of how long this is going to take? Any indication at all? Well, uh, you know, things have changed so much o over the past week that, uh, you know, they could go quicker from now on. What I would say is that uh, the last time there was a meeting like this, which was not on the agenda, that it was called in a panic, that it was called in a rush, it was back in 2020 during the pandemic. And that's when the PEP program came about. And that was implemented and put together quicker. Uh, you know, th th that is essentially the, the comparison that we have uh, to this. The statement clearly doesn't say it. But to me, the fact that yesterday you have Isabel Schnabel coming out with there are no limits to what we can do. And now today say, let's get to work and put it uh, something or create something something that, that is an effective tool does show that behind the scenes in the governing council, at least they're more united than they were a week ago, mm. where they weren't simply able to answer that question. Maria, is a general statement 
Is it Brussels or right now is it every nation for themselves? No, I think, you know, I, I, I think a lot of things have changed. And when you compare this to the sovereign debt crisis, if you look at everything that's happened since the pandemic, it is clear that the European Union is becoming in many ways a, a fiscal monetary union and then a political union. It's not just uh, a simple trade block. But I think in the process, of course, there's questions about the fiscal that come with this. And I guess some of the members in the governing council will say, if we provide this tool, we also want to see guarantees that some of the countries, particularly in focus uh, on this, are going to to take things seriously, that things are going to change in terms of the fiscal story, too. Maria, do you have the sense that the ECB and the governing council was taken off guard on how quickly and violently the uh, Italian 10-year yield moved? I think they were. I think they were. If you look at that press conference yesterday, last week, Christine Lagarde was asked four times, how do you fight fragmentation? And she thought that would be enough to say we are ready to do it. And of course, we're very committed that our monetary policy feeds through to all of them. Again, the challenge for the central bank is that you deal with 19 different countries that are very different. So one policy fits all. It's, it's harder than, than other central banks. But I think they were. They were caught off guard. And this is why this meeting is happening today. And they've now decided to say this is not an abstract concept. We're going to put something on paper and create a tool that works. A tool that works, Maria. Thank you. Let's think about that. The most effective tool in central banking of the last 15 years was a tool that was never used. It was the ultimate mechanism behind whatever it takes from President Draghi. And Tom, sometimes they are the most effective mechanisms of central bankers. It's a backstop. It's the threat to use something that the market believes in that you never have to deploy. Mario Draghi managed to tighten bond spreads in a monster way with never, without buying a single bond through that program. So my issue with this time, this time around, is I'm not sure, and of course I don't know for sure, but I'm not sure at this point, that you can come up with something that isn't deployed oh. because of where inflation is and where rates are set to go because of what's <laughs> happening in the Treasury market and what's happening at the Fed. I'm not sure a backstop per se is sufficient to address what's happening in this market right now, but we'll see. On radio, we've got the, the banner up right now. Here it is verbatim. ECB tells staff to prepare new anti-crisis tool for approval. Yeah. And the anti-crisis tool is simple. Who's going to take the loss? I can't say this enough, John. Most argument, this is Alan Meltzer 101. Somebody has to figure out who takes the loss. And Meltzer 101 Ala Bernanke, later on, is the government of the United States under question of the Fed, takes the loss. Who takes the loss in Europe? That's a debate, right? A great example of what's happening in monetary policy right now is the Bank of Japan, Lisa, and I know you want to go there. The BOJ is saying, here's our cap on 10-year yields, but just saying it in this market isn't enough anymore. You actually have to back it up by getting into the market and buying at that level. And buying at record amounts, and even then it's not good enough because people are still betting against the Japanese uh, central bank saying that they're not going to be able to do this. But the reason why I'm referencing this with respect to the ECB is they have to be ready to deploy it. And then what do they do when it doesn't work anymore? When markets push against them so much based on fundamental issues, including inflation, that they're forced to capitulate. At what point is the ECB going to be not necessarily in the same situation, but an analogous yeah. well, one? We've got to see what the vehicle is and the details of that vehicle. This is a plan to make a plan. And then we'll see if that plan to make a plan is ultimately approved further down the road and whether it addresses what's happening in this bond market. I can tell you that this bond market is turning around. We're down just 25 basis points on an Italian 10-year, threatening to get back to about 4%. I want to bring in Javier Blas of Bloomberg Opinion, columnist. Javier, at the epicenter of so much of this is what is happening with the energy market. We're seeing the average gas price in America through $5, and we're seeing central banks respond to what is happening with headline inflation. Javier, we've heard from several politicians that are trying to make the point that they would like to see more refining capacity. They'd like these companies to spend more money at the same time they're threatening with windfall taxes too. Javier, make sense of what's happening on the policy front, together with the politics of what we're witnessing right now in the global energy market. I, I cannot make sense, John. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You cannot be threatening the industry with windfall taxes and at the same time telling the industry, oh, please, can you drill more and can you build a refinery? Because now we, we have realized that we don't have a refinery. At the same time, you are telling the industry, we don't want you and um, we will prefer to do without you and move to green energy. Uh, the energy policy right now is a complete mess. We are paying the price of very unfocused energy policy over the last few years. The most important point today, I think, 
Agency, International Energy Agency took the first look into 2023 and the landscape that they are picturing is pretty ugly. Oil demand remains very strong despite an, a cooling economy and supply is not able to, to match. So we are heading forward pretty high prices for the rest of the year and potentially right. now into 2023. Javier, very quickly here, we're really constrained on time. In the United States, there was a refinery of Marathon in Louisiana and now, umpteen years later, 30 years later, there's a new greenfield uh, opening in North Dakota with Meridian. I mean, that's how hard it is to build a refinery in America, isn't it? It's very hard. No one wants to build a refinery. We have had expansions. But the biggest problem is over the last two years, we have lost a, a significant amount of refinery. Worldwide, we lost the most refining capacity in 30 years in 2021. And that is going to take time to, to address. And the only way to address really the mismatch that we have right now between supply and demand is to lower demand. And for that, you need a recession. Javier, and that's the problem for the politicians and the central banks alike. Bloomberg's Javier Blast there on the energy market. And the energy market sparking a big problem for these policymakers right now. A bigger problem, I would say, for this ECB, Tom. What a challenge they've got to raise interest rates and cap what's happening in the bond market. Italian 10 year yields getting back to 393. Yes. Still down on the session in a big way, but way off the lows. Well, you've got to watch those select group of bonds. I mean, I get that the Italians front and center because of size and maybe the prestige of Draghi, but uh, John, this is a day to really look at bond price in Europe and coming off the Fed meeting and our coverage this afternoon, frankly, tick by tick each question within the press conference. Lisa, I'd love a final word on what we're seeing taking place this morning. It's pushing back. People aren't believing exactly what the ECB is saying. There was an expectation for something bigger than what was delivered. That is the message coming from both the moves that you're seeing in the Italian bond market as well as in the euro. <clears throat> Lower the session on the Italian 10 year, 810, 376. Right now, about 15 minutes later, 393. That's the turnaround off the back of this ECB statement. Turnaround in the euro too. Euro dollar looks a little something like this. Positive two tenths of 1%. It was much higher on that currency pair earlier. 104.36. Equities hanging in there up eight tenths of 1% on this Fed decision day. More coverage still to come with Lara Rame of FS Investments. From New York City, heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg. Just to give you an idea of the scale of this Federal Reserve meeting a little bit later this afternoon, we've got retail sales out any second now. Hardly been talked about anywhere this morning, including on this network. Let's get you some of that economic data, shall we? Let's get Mike McKee into the conversation. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Retail sales yet to drop from the Census Bureau, but the Empire Manufacturing number is out and it rises to negative 1.2 from 11, negative 11.6, a little bit better, but still not great news about manufacturing. Import prices have come in up by six tenths. The forecast was for a 1.1% rise. Now, ex petroleum, they were down a tenth. So that's a little bit of good news on the inflation front. Here come retail sales, the advanced number down three tenths. The forecast was for up a tenth, and last month it was up nine tenths. So the numbers are not particularly good on retail sales because remember, this is not adjusted for inflation. X autos, they're up half a percent. That's less than the seven tenths that was forecast. And retail control, which is the number that uh, Economist Watch goes into GDP, basically is flat, no change at all. It was up half a percent uh, in the month of April, which is a revision by half a percent lower from the original 1% reported. So basically what we're seeing here is a pullback in retail sales, uh, people not buying as much gasoline stations on the month up 4.4% and 43.2% for the year. And uh, some others are pretty negative. Motor vehicles down 3.5%, furniture down 9 tenths of a percent, electronics down 1.3%. And remember, that's inflation adjusted. So it does look like consumers began to pull back in the month of May. Mike McKee, two-part question with a when and a how. When would this Federal Reserve be confronted with worse economic data than this? And how will they respond to it? 
Well, that's the question. Uh, the <laughs> the uh, two, three, four hundred basis point question is how soon does the economy cool off and what are the signs going to be? A certain amount of it is maybe people pulling back because of inflation. But uh, when do we see demand destruction? Is this a sign of it starting? Uh, we'll have to see. And then uh, we'll find out this afternoon how fast they're well, going to move and where, whether they think they need to go. They won't say the word recession, but go restrictive. Mike, you're going to be in that press conference. Is this retail sales, and particularly combined with the previous month revisions, is it enough to shift the 50 or 75 debate? I doubt it, Tom. I think uh, the Fed is focused on inflation right now rather than growth. And growth is strong enough. They've made that case over and over again that they can look <clears throat> past this. It's a one month's data. We'll see if it continues. But that CPI report apparently did worry them quite a bit. And the University of Michigan numbers that suggest inflation expectations are rising is probably the overhang for all of it. Mike, I realize we can't extrapolate out, but let's say we do, and this slowing in consumer spending persists for a number of months. Does this make the Fed's job easier or harder? Well, it probably makes the Fed's job a little easier if it's accompanied by a drop in inflation. If demand destruction leads to lower prices, then the Fed does have the opportunity to back off a little bit. And maybe they go back to their plan of uh, not necessarily pausing, but at least looking around and recalibrating how much they do each month when we get to the fall. Again, <laughs> that puts a lot of the onus on Jay Powell's Jackson Hole appearance. Uh, but at this point, the Fed has got to fi fight inflation. And, you know, when we're still over 8 percent, 8.6 percent on the CPI headline, uh, that yep. gets into people's heads. And they've got to do something about that. And Mike McKee can't wait for your coverage a little bit later. We'll catch up a little bit later this morning, too, ahead of that. Mike McKee, thank you. Something Mike McKee said there is so, so important. So headline inflation for the month of May disappoints, downside surprise. The previous revision, not great either. Tom, think about this, where inflation was and the fact that that data is not inflation adjusted. Yeah, it's not inflation adjusted is key, John. And, and I, again, I really, really wait to the revision. And I, I really can't convey this enough, folks. You look at the screen and the red and the green blinky blinky of the famed Bloomberg screen. I mean, it lit up like a candle there, John, as people responded. to That's those weak reports. data, Tom. That is weak economic data. Yeah. Uh, DXY out over 105. We're watching Euro again off the festivities there. Weaker Euro, 104.31 in the last two hours. A perfect time to speak to Laura Rahm. She's chief U.S. economist at FS Investments. Today's phrase, Laura, is crisis tool. Europe is in search of a crisis tool. What does the acclaimed Rahm inflation crisis tool look like? I think that the crisis tool is clearly just trying to reclaim some credibility. And, you know, we've talked about being behind the curve. These central banks just have to try to, uh, you know, assert control and just calm markets. It's I don't think it's even uh, frustration with some of the air getting let out of financial conditions, but they want to try to calm markets that they are on top of managing inflation and managing policy. And I think that is what has been so difficult. And that's why we're seeing central banks around the globe. Uh, really, that's what they struggle with. Laura, is 75 basis points enough to get the job done? I think that the Fed, I, I think it's a step in the right direction because for the Fed, it's just, you know, I think giving that impression that they are on it, they're, de they're data dependent. I think that they have suffered from this idea that they're going to wait several meetings to see how things flush out. That is gone. Um, so there's a proactivity there. But I do think that we are, as we get data that is already starting to roll over in several categories, the possibility that they are going to have to um, you know, really tighten into the face of weakening demand. And that, I think, is going to not help them at all. Well, uh, this is interesting because it's sort of the opposite of what Mike McKee and other people have been saying, which is it may help the Fed to see a cooling in the economic data because it indicates that perhaps not at this meeting or next meeting, but at the end of this year, they'll be looking at inflation trends that are more in their favor. What's your pushback to that narrative? So, you know, the issue is that Fed rate hikes just take a really long time to impact the economy. And I think the when you think about demand destruction and where inflation is really coming from, it's shifted to now coming not from 
uh, you know, auto prices, but really coming from rents, areas in the economy which are much more uh, sticky. And for that reason, you know, you really need to get an, you know, housing to not only roll over, but house prices to moderate more significantly. These are changes that don't happen overnight, and they're changes that really come with um, you know, a wider implication for growth. So we've already got household sentiment under pressure. We've already uh, seen households be impacted by inflation very negatively. The demand destruction is already here. Well, what's the math here, Laura? If we get a 75 beat move, a three quarters of a percentage point move, does the 30 year mortgage go up three quarters of a percentage point? It's actually mortgage rates have gone up more than the long end has risen. So, you know, I, yeah, I think we continue to see um, mortgage rates go higher. We've already seen, mar you know, the housing market cool down. I think what we really are talking about is, you know, the labor, the connection between the economy to the labor market and the fact that there's a reason the Fed has trouble micromanaging demand. You know, they are a broadsword. They're not a scalpel. So for that reason, I think there's just more. This is the tip of the iceberg when you look at um, demand cooling. And I think you could argue that demand right now isn't even really cooling because of Fed rate hikes. It's cooling because of inflation. So you look at the rate hikes they're making right now, that's going to impact the economy in several quarters. So they're they're really tightening aggressively into an economy that's already slowing. So what will the confused rhetoric be of this central bank after the press conference today? We've covered confusion in ECB today like truly we've never seen. Are we going to be as confused? I, I don't think so, because I don't think they're going to change their um, statement very much. I do think that in the press conference, Powell is going to continue to sound very optimistic about the Fed's ability to create a soft landing. Um, but I think he wants to really strike a very serious tone on the inflation front. I think it'll be interesting to see how, you know, if we get another month of an upside surprise of inflation, what this means for the July meeting. You know, these are things that I think, you know, just how sensitive to month to month data they're going to be. Because, you know, the real, I think now piece that we're waiting for is to see how the employment market responds. That to me is really going to make or break how aggressive the Fed can be. And markets have, you know, priced up the whole curve. They're now expecting the Fed to raise rates to 4% by the beginning of 2023. Laura Ryan, thank you of FS Investments looking ahead to the Federal Reserve, not just today's decision, but the summary of economic projections as well and an update to that dot plot. I'm going to catch up with two of the best. We're going to catch up with two of the best in the next hour. Lisa Shattert of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, Bob Michael from JP Morgan Asset Management. TK will do that in the next hour on Bloomberg TV. I look at this, John. It's just absolutely extraordinary. I can't say enough, folks, how absolutely unique today is. I mean, there's no other way to put it, John. Yeah, Lisa, this afternoon, a Federal Reserve and an unexpected central bank meeting this morning with the ECB. Laura Rehm uh, highlighted it really well, hiking into weakness, and that is the theme across the board. When do we start talking about stagflation, and what does the bank do with that? I mean, the central banks, that is their nightmare, and that seems to be more of what we're looking at, but it's moving so quickly, and it's getting harder for economists to really get their hands around what to expect in any monthly data. John, the thing I would say here is all we're left with is price, and price comes in many ways, including yield. I'll take yield as being one price indicator. But right now, I've got a modest and fragile pennant on euro at a 104.32. And the ramifications, if that breaks down to weaker euro, are incalculable. Futures right now up 8 tenths of 1% on the S&P. And then that's that 100 up by one full percentage point. We'll guide you through that Fed decision a little bit later this afternoon. 1.30 Eastern time, Tom Keane. Lisa Bramitz and Jonathan Farrow with a Bloomberg Surveillance Fed special a little bit later from New York, heard on radio, seen on TV. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. U.S. Democrats appear to be considering new energy legislation. Sources say Oregon Senator Ron Wyden may propose a surtax of up to 42 percent on companies that record a profit margin better than 10 percent. Democrats and the White House are struggling to curb U.S. energy costs and broader inflation. 
Bloomberg's front row looked at the strategy and perspective of the asset manager for one of the world's largest privately owned management firms, John Haynes, who oversees almost $1.3 trillion. Talk to Eric Schatzka about environmental, social and corporate governance. We don't think it's woke. We think it's part of like a very, very important part of studying the opportunity set and the risk set of, of 5,000 companies. Is that to say there's alpha in ESG or alpha in sustainability? Abs yeah, absolutely. You believe that? I believe that. Heinz also talked about the challenges of running a private partnership in an increasingly competitive industry. The UK has cancelled its first flight, deporting asylum seekers to Rwanda. The European Court of Human Rights blocked the deportation, saying there's a risk of irreversible harm for the asylum seekers. The government says it is trying to discourage the work of human smugglers, but the policy has been condemned by UK rights groups and some lawmakers. Bill Gates has dismissed cryptocurrency and NFTs as shams based on what he calls the greater fool theory. Speaking at a climate conference, Gates said digital banking efforts supported by his philanthropic foundations are hundreds of times more efficient than crypto. Gates sparred with Elon Musk last year over whether Bitcoin was too risky for retail investors and the environmental harm of mining coins. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. People have just been calling this peak of inflation. We say you can't call a peak until the peak is over. People were too early to call the peak in inflation. We're going to start calling those type of peaks when we actually see that the market confirms that they are going down. This conversation got a real buzz yesterday out in the zeitgeist. Catherine Kaminsky, she is with Alpha Simplex. And for those not in the know, this had to do with turtle trading and trend-based trading. It was a clinic on trying to find peaks and troughs in a market. We're going to do that right now. We're going to begin with a clinic with a chart. Joining us, Kriti Gupta on liquidity and bonds. I'm stepping on Lisa's toes here a little bit. But I'm going to try to do this concept justice. <laughs> I like to like to keep her on her toes. Uh, this is a really important concept because as we talk about higher volatility, you got to talk about the liquidity as well. And that brings me right to my chart of the day, looking at a Bloomberg index that measures the trader's ability to execute deals without affecting the price. For our radio audience, the line just goes higher and higher and higher over the last few months. Now going back to levels last seen in March of 2020. Remember, the market was not functioning then, and it's not just something you're you're seeing in the chart is something a lot of these banks are actively talking about. Morgan Stanley saying that the liquidity in some shorter term U.S. Treasuries are flashing warning signals. And unlike in 2020, mm. the market does not have the backstop of central banks that according to an internal note to clients. So once again, this is very much a part of what people are talking about. And remember, today is day one of QT, the idea that $15 billion of maturing treasuries, well, they're not getting reinvested. What happens when that scale increases more and more time? And wrapped around in the ECB and Fed uh, joint meeting, it appears to be today. Kriti Gupta, thank you so much. And Lisa, this really comes to the heart of the matter, which is the trust within short-term paper. And I will just say for the record, Kriti, you are never stepping on my toes, and I'm glad you're highlighting important yeah. points. I'll take because care of right, now, uh, right now, right <clears throat> now, liquidity is one of the main concerns that a lot of bond traders have. Among them, Ira Jersey, chief U.S. interest rate strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence, who's been covering the bond market and watching it uh, for decades. Ira, how poor is liquidity in the biggest, most liquid market that is thought of as completely safe and is trading like Bitcoin? Well, <laughs> Well, it's, for, firstly, it's not. I, I would argue that it's not trading like Bitcoin. Um, but the in, in terms of liquidity, it's certainly the worst liquidity we've had since the global financial crisis. And, and we all knew that something like this was, was likely to happen, primarily because banks don't have the ability to, and dealers don't have the ability to intermediate the market the way that they used to, because the the size of the market has grown exponentially over the past uh, over the past couple of years. And at the same time, the uh, the dealer balance sheets haven't been able to expand. So financing trades and the way the plumbing all works um, has just not grown and has actually gotten worse because of some of the regulations that have been placed into effect to try and make 
banks safe and sound, you're now making uh, making their ability to intermediate markets well, less less possible. Ira, on a high level uh, kind of conceptual basis, can you give us a sense of what happens when the system gets gummed up, when some of the trading stops in the same way that people have become accustomed to? Well, what it really means is that it used to be that a bank or, or even a hedge fund was able to buy a bond and then finance that via the repurchase agreement market. And the repurchase agreement market is what, what SOFR, the, the LIBOR replacement, is made up of. And it's a huge market, right? It's a trillion dollars a day, more or less, trades in that market on, on an overnight basis. But the problem is that trillion dollars is the same size as it's been basically for the last 20 years. And meanwhile, the market's gone from you know a couple of trillion dollars uh, it, the Treasury market's gone from a couple of trillion dollars upwards of twenty trillion dollars, right? So, so that's grown ten times. Uh, so, so what happens is when when a dealer buys a bond, they have to be able to finance it somehow. And if they can't finance it, then bid offers widen, and that's one of the things you're seeing in the liquidity index. Or, or they have to go out and find a, another right. uh, another person on the buy side to to take it from them, and that means that they have to move the price probably. So that's I think one of the big reasons you're seeing uh, the the size moves that you're getting. I'm, I'm not surprised by the level. I'm just surprised by how quickly we're getting to some of these levels. And, and that's where mm. the liquidity situation is showing itself. Ira, a most unusual day, this emergency European Central Bank uh, meeting. And clearly the observation is Europe is different. Europe has bonds, many more bonds on a relative basis. How do you expect bond prices to react and respond in Europe as they go in search of a new crisis tool? <laughs> Yeah, so so it's really will we get the periphery spreads down? Like I even think in Europe they don't mind yields in in general going up, but it's more the, again the liquidity magnitude and, um, and and the spread for some of the sovereign countries over there that's that's going to take precedence. And the reason why the ECB you know felt it necessary to uh, to have this emergency meeting today, um, but but it's also uh, it's also not a, again not a major surprise just given the liquidity situation there as well. Um, and and you. you see the fragility of something like the, the Eurozone system, because um, even though you have a, a single currency, you still don't have a single fiscal structure, right? So one of the advantages that the United States has and, and Japan and some of the other large sovereign bond markets is you do have a very homogenous government uh, fiscal system in, in general. Um, and and I think it's going to be more and more difficult, especially in times of, of stress when markets are falling, for, yeah. um, for, for those peripheral countries not to have some kind of integration with the core. What we're really talking about here, Ira, and again, folks, into our coverage this afternoon, is people arguing about who's going to take the loss. <laughs> Who takes the loss when bond prices go down? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, everyone does, and and you know, the taxpayer ultimately does in the United States because the you have to pay higher yields to finance deficits and to refinance some of the maturities that are coming up, and that's especially true now because. Um, you know, today is QT day. So today is the first day that we have maturities uh, of Treasury securities that are not going to be reinvested. So you just have more people um, that, that uh, more investors that need to try to buy the, that paper um, going forward. Um, now, those auctions were last week. So so we kind of know the price that was ha had to be paid in order to uh, to refinance those. But nonetheless, you're going to see yeah. more and more liquidity issues as, as time goes on. And, and everyone pays the price ultimately, right? The economy in general pays the price. But we are already paying the price. And I think that's the point, right? You're, we're, we're, look, when you look at what the market's pricing right now for June CPI and for July CPI, we're talking about 9% CPI prints the next two months. So, Tom, that's that's something that, you mm -hmm. know, central banks and the Fed in particular, I think at this point, really want to get try to get in front of because they're already behind. Mm -hmm. Ira Jersey, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. And Lisa, that goes to the resiliency of oil. Brent crude to the 120 handle moments ago, printing 121. Is it 124? No, but certainly the idea of a pullback in hydrocarbons just simply hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. I just want to note, heading about 35 minutes to the opening bell in New York City, that we are seeing a further lift, a real build on some of the strength that we saw that rebound or trying to have a bit of a bounce ahead of the open. And it really comes the extra leg on that weaker than expected uh, spending data and as well as empire manufacturing for the month of June. Tom, this is significant. People are viewing this, at least in markets, as possibly a ray of hope for the Fed that there's already a cooling in the economy that will allow them yeah. to not move as fast, as far, whether that's borne out and what yeah. they say about that today will be interesting. 
Give me an intraday chart on the way out, guys. We got to do this differently. Euro, right now, there's only one word plunging, dramatically weaker Euro as we go into the next hour. What an eventful, historic day. Our Fed coverage this afternoon. <laughs> 